It sustains us and is home to more than half of all life on Earth today. The presence of the ocean touches every living thing, no matter where it lives. The air we breathe and the water we consume are ultimately linked to the seas. The ocean drives our weather. and stabilizes our climate. Nowhere is more powerful and unforgiving. Yet more beautiful and endlessly fascinating. Yet for too long, we have taken the ocean for granted. Our actions have pushed species to the brink and had an impact on every ocean habitat, no matter how remote or how deep. We haven't understood what the ocean does for us. The effects of climate change have been softened by the ocean. But now we are facing the consequences. The seas are warming, rising, and becoming more acidic. It's a sobering thought that coral reefs may be lost within the next century. We all need a healthy ocean, so we must change our ways. Together with the right management, we can repopulate the seas. We can reduce marine pollution and minimize the impact of ocean acidification. The ocean's power of regeneration is remarkable if we just offer it the chance. It's not too late. We are in reach of a whole new relationship with the ocean, a wiser, more sustainable relationship. choice lies with us. Thank you, Trisha, for playing that video. And welcome, everybody. Um, if you didn't hear me before, could you please turn off your videos and your microphones um, while you're not speaking? To all the speakers, thank you. And we will begin now. Okay. I'm so excited to have you all here. My name is Summer Benjamin. I'll be your virtual master of ceremony for this event. I'm 16 and I've been part of the pop movement for almost a year now. I've been working on a project to reduce single-use plastics in restaurants, which you'll hear more about later. Today will mark the first event of the new Pop Oceans movement that we launched in March at the World Sustainable Development Forum in Durango, Mexico. We have many distinguished speakers here from today. This event will kick off many upcoming Pop events, such as the Youth Advocacy and the Ocean Literacy Series. I also encourage all of you to post this event on social media, tagging hashtag Pop Ocean Action, hashtag climate action now, and hashtag world ocean day. Over the course of the event, 
If you have any questions, please type them in the chat. We will be having a Q&A at the end as well. Also, again, could everybody keep their microphones off until you're speaking? Finally, before we begin, I want to let all the speakers know that I will be reminding you when you have a minute remaining. And now, it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. Ash Pachuri, senior member of the POP movement, award-winning leader dedicated to mentoring and empowering youth around the world to give the opening remarks. Dr. Ash. A big welcome to everyone. It is a great pleasure and honor to welcome each of you to the POP Ocean Virtual Summit hosted by the POP or Protect Our Planet movement in collaboration with the World Sustainable Development Forum. I thank you, your excellencies and distinguished guests for, uh, for being with us here and uh, distinguished speakers for your leadership and inspiration and for humbling us with your, with your presence and invaluable support to the POP Ocean Initiative. I also want to thank each of our participants for joining us and taking ocean action. A big welcome. Today is of special significance to the POP movement, which was founded by our chief mentor, Dr. R.K. Pachori on Earth Day 2016. Dr. Pachori said, and I quote, the oceans of the world are facing a serious threat, not only from sea level rise due to melting of ice on land and the Arctic ice cover, thermal expansion of the ocean and the rapid increase in ocean pollution from human activities, including plastic waste. Human society has to implement rapid changes. The youth of the world have to seize the moment and become leaders of urgent action under the pop movement. Quotes closed. So I speak here today in Dr. Pachori's honor as the POP Ocean Virtual Summit commemorates World Ocean Day, which is also celebrating the theme of innovation for a sustainable ocean. The current virtual summit also marks the launch of the POP Ocean Training and Advocacy mini-series, which will continue through the summer of 2020 and beyond, mobilizing youth voices and youth action to urgently protect our ocean by designing and implementing creative and innovative projects, solutions, and actions. So I take this opportunity today to invite all of you to join. The need for this urgent action and initiative is underscored as we live through an unprecedented time of pandemic caused by human destruction of biodiversity and fragile ecosystems, including the ocean, which puts us at even greater risk of infections, such as the novel coronavirus. It is clear that the health of our only planet and the health of every species that inhabits it are inextricably linked. All lives matter. So let's treat this unprecedented time as a wake up call. Let, let's, in Dr. Pachori's words, seize the moment and become leaders of urgent action under the pop movement and protect our planet of which the ocean is 70 percent of its surface today let's open our, our eyes and recognize that with no ocean there is no planet welcome to the pop ocean virtual summit your excellencies distinguished speakers and as my father always said our universal family we invite you to join hands, unite, and take action to protect our ocean now. Let, let our struggles become our strength. Let adversity translate to action, as we have seen in all moments building up to today that have changed the course of history. We watched an inspiring video just a few minutes ago by Sir David Attenborough screened at the beginning of the summit and we'll watch another inspirational video and special message right after this shared by His Serene Highness Prince Albert of Monaco. As you reflect on his message, the earlier video and the important insights and wisdom we are going to be exposed to throughout the summit today, I request you to look inward, be inspired and use the chat box throughout the summit to share your inspiration and the action you 
will take to protect our ocean. So I request you, let's take a few seconds and start now. Please reflect and share. Thank you and a big welcome to each one of you. Thank you so much, Dr. Ash, for your words. As Ash said, uh, we're going to play a pre-recorded message by His Serene Highness Prince Albert II of Monaco, a strong voice and advocate for oceans, who has shared a special message for us all today as we gather here to mark World Oceans Day. His Serene Highness Prince Albert II is, a, is the reigning monarch of the Principality of Monaco. He is also a renowned conservationist and advocate of the Earth's marine and polar environments. We are truly honored by his participation in the Pop Oceans Virtual Summit. Um, Drisha, could you please play the video? Mes chers amis, depuis que l'épidémie de coronavirus a frappé nos pays, nos communautés et nos familles, nous avons vu nos océans changer. Ces changements sont riches de signification et porteurs d'espoir. Ce sont des plus clair car moins pollué, des espèces réapparaissant dans des zones jadis désertées, des écosystèmes retrouvant un peu de leur santé. En quelques semaines, nous avons vu que les évolutions de nos modes de vie avaient des conséquences immédiates sur l'état des mers. Pourtant, ces progrès risquent d'être vite oubliés si nous nous contentons, après la crise, de revenir au même fonctionnement d'avant la crise. Si nous renouons avec notre modèle de développement égoïste et destructeur qui a tant abîmé les milieux marins. C'est pourquoi il nous faut tirer profit de cette situation et nous mobiliser pour les océans en ce jour qui leur est dédié tout au long de l'année. Nous savons ce dont nos océans ont besoin. La lutte contre les pollutions, notamment plastiques, le développement d'une pêche et d'une aquaculture durable, la protection de la biodiversité. L'extension des aires marines protégées qui devrait couvrir 30% de la surface des océans la préservation du climat, l'instauration d'un vrai statut de la haute mer, la promotion d'un tourisme réellement durable. Tous ces objectifs sont à notre portée. Nous avons vu au cours des dernières semaines que nous acceptions de changer face à un danger à court terme. Plus que jamais, il nous faut donc convaincre, en particulier la jeunesse, qui a dans ses mains, avec son avenir, celui de notre planète, de l'importance des océans. Alors que notre monde prend conscience de ses fragilités, alors que chacun s'interroge sur la manière de réinventer nos économies et nos sociétés, vous devez, nous devons tous, nous mobiliser pour que les océans soient au cœur du monde qu'il nous faut reconstruire. C'est le sens de mon engagement avec ma fondation et avec mon gouvernement, et c'est ce que tu aimerais nous inspirer cette journée mondiale des océans. Je vous remercie. My thoughts are especially with the participants of the Pop Ocean Virtual Summit. I wish every success to their meeting today. I'm sure that the late Dr. Rajendra Kumar Pachari, founder of the movement, who unfortunately left us a few months ago, would be happy to see the one prosper as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing the video. And as His Excellency said, we need to take advantage of this time. So good job for all of you for being here and taking action now. We will begin with the first session. The first session today is called Why the Ocean? This important opening session will explore the relevance of the ocean and ocean-related environmental issues. The changes in the ocean and the Anthropocene will be explored and discussed. The moderator for this session will be Marisa Lopez, mentor at Pop Oceans and founder of Bluer Future. The speakers for this session include Her Excellency Dr. Amina Gurib Fakim, former president of Mauritius. Dr. Mina has served as professor, dean of faculty, and pro-vice chancellor at the University of Mauritius. She has also co-authored more than 30 books, book chapters, and scientific articles, is the recipient of five honorary doctorates, and has received numerous international honors and prizes. Also, His Excellency Jose Manuel Barroso who is the former president of the European Commission and has served as Prime Minister of Portugal. He is currently visiting a prof as professor at, Cath at the Catholic University of Portugal and the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva. And finally, our two youth speakers, Caroline and Lauren Sandberg, who join us from the Sierra Nevada. 
They're both students at Toho Expedition Academy and leaders of the Eco Leaders and the Earth Warriors Environmental Club. Marisa, I invite you to please start the session. Thank you, Summer. We're so excited to have everybody here and have these fantastic speakers. So thanks everybody for joining us. Um, we are going to start with this question, why the ocean? Uh, this is our opening session and we really are excited to have our speakers here to help us explore, explore what is really the relevance of the ocean right now in this era that we're in when we have a lot of conflicting pri priorities that we have to address in this world. There is a lot that we need to deal with right now. So why should the ocean be front of mind today and every day? And so um, Her Excellency, Amina, we're going to ask you to please open the session. We're very happy to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us um, on this beautiful day. I will let you take the mic. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me well? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, excellencies, distinguished guests, young people, thank you very much for associating with this event. And I will have a particular word of thanks for Ash Pachori. Shanali and of course the entire pop movement for associating with this very, very important event, which is of course celebrating today our ocean. So ladies and gentlemen, I grew up on an island and from a very young age, I had learned to appreciate the magic of the oceans and also how it inspires fear and respect. Our ocean's vastness presents another threat. We don't know the depth of the ocean in the course of a day, we don't see the effects of climate change every single day. We just see this great big ocean and we wrongly assume that it's too big to be wrecked. It's easy as a consequence to diminish the urgency of the challenge. Yet we know that climate change and pollution are damaging our environment and the oceans. I find it unacceptable that the magic of a pristine ocean that I enjoyed as a child might no longer be transmitted to the next generation. These challenges that the oceans face demand collective action and deserves the world attention. It will be a recognition of the reality that the ocean's health is our health. And if we agree that the oceans connect us all, they will, by corollary, affect us all. Oceans are home to millions across the world and provide food and nutrition for more than a billion people. My small island country, Mauritius, is located in the Southwest Indian Ocean, the world's third largest oceanic division. Since time immemorial, the lives, livelihood, and traditions of Mauritians have been inextricably linked to the ocean. For us, the ocean economy and the national economy are indistinguishable. So the investment we make today in terms of advocacies, policies and resource will not only serve our economy, our well-being, but will also be critical to our foreign policy and our security and is vital to who we are as a race. Ladies and gentlemen, dangerous changes in our climate caused in the age of the Anthropocene, dead zones in our oceans caused again by man-made pollution, unsustainable fishing practices, unprotected marine areas used to be home to rare species and entire ecosystems are putting at risk our own livelihoods. The health of the oceans will define in large part our health and the health of our economies. So how we treat our oceans is a burden as the oceans feed us, protect us, regulate our climate, our weather, anchor industries for transportation to tourism to trade of all kinds. Our conservation efforts and our obligations to combat climate change go hand in hand because marine areas already have to cope with overfishing and ship traffic and pollution from both macro and microplastics. Our oceans act like sponges, absorbing most of the extra heat caused by global warming greenhouse gases, which are our common enemy, as they are the cause of the ocean's falling oxygen levels and the rising level of acidity, both trends are changing the chemistry, exacerbating and stressing life under the waves. Our escalating greenhouse gas emissions are the cause of the warming of the ocean, by which coral is bleached, ecosystems lost, extreme weather events fomented, 
and sea level made to rise ever upwards. As oceans warm and sea levels rise, our lives and livelihoods are likely to be changed too. Home will become uninhabitable. Floods will increasingly devastate communities. Crops will wither and industries like fishing disrupted having rippling effects on the food chain. Cultures that have coexisted with the ocean for millennia are forced to flee to higher grounds and over the years will be threatened with extinction. The more of these threats that we eliminate through conservation, the more resilient those ecosystems will be to the consequences of climate change. Ladies and gentlemen, recognizing the fragility of these ecosystems, the UN has dedicated SDG 14, setting out a series of targets aimed at conserving and sustainably using the ocean resources. We will need a compass to guide our recovery course and we have a reliable one in the form of 2030 Sustainable Development Agenda coupled with the Paris Climate Agreement. Through these, we can ensure that short-term recovery solutions are in, in accord with long-term development and climate action objectives. The vision of a blue-green post-pandemic recovery fully accepts the priorities of fostering economic development and creating employment at the same time promoting greater social equity and welfare. In the energy sectors, tradition transition to renewables, for example, it foresees innovative energy storage, the installation of flexible power grids, electric vehicle charging systems, green hydrogen, and multiple other energy development technologies. All of these will mean jobs, jobs, and more jobs. The blue-green recovery road will take us through economic weight stations and environmental agreements that will bring human systems and natural systems into a new harmony based on respect and balance. This must surely be the hallmark of any forthcoming UN Ocean Treaty Conference on Biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction, so that we will soon live in a world in which at least 30% of the ocean out to the 70% outside of natural jurisdiction is protected and the effective and well-managed conservation measures. Ladies and gentlemen, think only of the fact that every second breath you take comes from the ocean. You will find good reason to welcome that prospect. We have already known that humans and nature are part of one connected system with nature providing us with our basic needs and much more. Yet, lately, we have been riding over nature's benefit roughshod, taking too much for granted disguising greed in our finest costume of profit and progress. On the blue-green recovery road, we will set out to put that right. We will move from linear exploitation of finite plant resources into a sustainable era of circular economies. We will advance into sustainable food systems, resilient cities, and rapid transition into renewable energy systems. And we will safeguard the biodiversity of nature upon which our lives ultimately depend. In the interest of the ocean's health, when we say we will plant a trillion trees, yet science has shown us how a healthy plankton population can easily surpass these trillion trees. Still, we must include the restoration of mangroves, seagrass, and kelp in the knowledge that they sequester four times more carbon than their terrestrial cousins. Blue-green recovery foresees an end to the unconscionable levels of pollution and waste for which we have of late been responsible. It demands an end to harmful subsidies distorting such sectors as oil, gas, and fisheries. It demands an end to the international scandals of illegal fishing, overfishing, and modern slavery at sea. When it, what it expects of government around the world is to look beyond the short term and put in place equitable policies, investment decisions that are in harmony with a sustainable future. In the long run, the survival of our kind may be intrinsically linked to the fate of corals. Thus, the course of blue-green recovery must steer us well away from the dreaded territory of 1.5 to 2 degree centigrade global warming. So ladies and gentlemen, if we care about the legacy that we will leave our children, we will have to act boldly. And now, as it becomes increasingly clear 
that we cannot seriously protect our planet without protecting our oceans. If we love our children and theirs, if we love this planet, and if you love life itself, then staying true to that course is the ultimate obligation. Sustaining our own ways will but resume a course toward devastating hurricanes, flooding coasts, vast wildfires, proliferation of famines and wars, massive displacement of population, and the recurrence of global pandemics. A blue-green recovery has faith in the genius of our species, our powers of innovation, and our ability to share ideas and resources with empathy in adversity. We must take these currents while they serve us through the sadness, trauma, and the sacrifice that the COVID-19 pandemic has brought upon us. Finally, we must interiorize the saying that we did not inherit the earth from, the parent, from our parents, but we borrowed it from our grandchildren. Thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Amina. That was amazing. Yes, that was beautiful. And you have so many really important points. I mean, the, ocean, the health of the ocean is instricably uh, tied to our own health. So we cannot forget that. Um, we really appreciate that amazing presentation. Um, I am honored now to invite the next speaker, uh, His Excellency Jose Manuel Barroso. Uh, former President, European Commission, and former Prime Minister of Portugal. His Excellency, are you there? I yes. see you and you're unmuted. Thank you so much. Please take the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> it's indeed a pleasure for me to participate in this Protect, Protect Our Planet Ocean Virtual Summit, also to mark the World Oceans Day. This is a, a topic that is very close to my heart. I've been working on this matter while I was prime minister and also of my country, Portugal, but also in the European Commission. I was mainly focused on issues of governance of the oceans and also sustainability. And so I would like to share some of these considerations with you today, namely from a political and policy-making perspective, focusing also on Europe, but not only uh, on Europe. But let me start by paying tribute to the late Dr. Pachauri that unfortunately left us some time ago. Uh, I know how committed he was to the agenda for sustainability and also the fight against climate change. And I'm sure that uh, he will be proud to see his son and all of us today going on with this fight against climate change and for sustainability. So the oceans hold a key uh, to the future. They offer great potential for boosting growth, while they play a key role in regulating the climate system. But they are under threat from over-exploitation, climate change, acidification, pollution, and declining biodiversity. And there are also very serious uh, and worrying uh, issues of security and safety, various forms of crime uh, in the sea, from illegal fishing to illegal trafficking, including the trafficking, trafficking of human beings, to piracy. And there are also increased geopolitical tensions, namely because of attempts to assert territorial or maritime claims outside of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. So oceans, are at the same time a space of opportunity and hope, but let's be frank, also they are a space of danger and also uh, of anxiety because they are critically important for the future of our planet, but we are not sure about the very future of the ocean. This future of the oceans and its stability will have a major impact on our planet, our planet that we call Earth, but in fact, we could better call it water, since, uh, as we know, 70% of our planet is indeed covered by water. Curiously, uh, that is also more or less the part of water that a human being has when he's born. It's around 70% of water. And the issues that we are going to discuss in this summit, from the need to urgently reduce plastic pollution, 
to implement solutions for sustainable fishing and tourism, to address ocean acidification, to limit the sea level rise, all of those issues, of course, should be put under the framework of the United Nations guidelines, namely United Nations 230 Agenda for Sustainable Development and SDG Goal 14. That simply says, but that's very powerful at the same time, the goal is to conserve and sustainable um, use the oceans, sea, and marine resources. Now, as I said, I was very committed to the issue of governance. And in fact, in uh, 2007, as president of the European Commission, I launched the European Integrated Maritime Policy. In fact, already in 2004, when I assumed office, I thought it would make sense to have a commissioner fully dedicated to maritime policy and not only to fisheries, as it was in the past, so that we could build also on the experience of countries in setting a maritime strategy and uh, form a European policy in this field. In fact, as Prime Minister of Portugal, I also created the Portuguese maritime uh, integrated policy at the government level. I'm very proud of the early leadership uh, which the European Commission has shown in this increasingly important sector. Uh, and I'm also very um, motivated to see the ownership of our countries uh, about this policy. And we are now seeing that they are really committed to it. Uh, of course, not, not everything is perfect in Europe, not at all. But I think it's fair to say that the European Union has done a lot to push uh, this agenda not only the agenda of an integrated maritime policy, but also of real growth. And in fact, it was after the European Commission um, document of 2007 um, that we uh, were able, in the Limassol conference in 2012, to have an agreement of all the member states, not only on this integrated maritime policy, but also on the so-called blue growth that now is accepted and considered policy uh, for the European Union. So in our document in 2007, we said that the seas are trade routes, climate regulator, source of food, energy and resources, and uh, also a favorite site for citizens, residents and recreation. And the commission proposed an integrated maritime policy based on the European Union, based on the re clear recognition that all matters related to Europe's oceans and seas are interlinked, and that sea-related policies must develop in a joint up way if we are to reap the desired results. So the integrated maritime policy seeks to provide a coherent approach to maritime issues with increased coordination between different policy areas, namely the issue of combining, of course, sustainable growth with respect for the environment and the fight against climate change. The integrated maritime policy focuses on issues that do not fall under a single sector based policy. For instance, blue growth, economic growth based on different maritime sectors, and also issues that require the coordination of different sectors and actors. For instance, marine knowledge. Specifically, it covers the following cross cutting policies. Blue growth, already mentioned but also marine data and knowledge, maritime special planning, integrated maritime surveillance, and sea basin strategies. And it was also this integrated maritime policy that allowed afterwards uh, the strategy uh, of sustainable blue economy finance. And in fact, we established also with some private foundations a sustainable blue economy finance principles that was done in 2017. So I think we all agree that healthy oceans are essential for humankind as climate regulators, as a source of global food security, as a source of human health, and also as engine for economic growth. The OECD estimates that ocean-based industries uh, constitute rough, can uh, constitute roughly 2.6 trillion euros in 2030. Uh, um, to, and that is the contribution of the ocean economy to the global gross value-added economy. Oceans are also home to a rich and fragile biodiversity, still largely unexplored, 
Oceans produce half of oxygen of the Earth's atmosphere. They absorb 25% of CO2 emissions. Many islands, including small island developing states and coastal countries, are dependent on marine resources and are vulnerable to the uh, human actions uh, and, uh, that can put in question the conservation and sustainable use of the ocean. And we're also seeing naturally the increase of world population that will also increase the pressure on the ocean, also with the increased competition for raw materials, food, and water, and also increased illegal fishing, piracy, and marine pollution. And of course, that happens also with the threat of climate change. So all these reasons that I presented very, very quickly now are in fact a reason for an effective international ocean governance. And the commission that was already after my leadership in the commission, but of course in the good continuation of our goals, introduced it in uh, 2016 together with the high representative of the European Union, a, a strategy or a communication for international uh, ocean governance. And I insist on that matter that I'd like to focus on this today, um, knowing that other speakers are going to speak about other matters. This international ocean governance is about managing oceans and using their resources in a way that keeps oceans healthy, productive, safe, secure, and resilient. The reality is today around 64% of the oceans, according to the European experts, around 64% of the oceans are outside the border of national jurisdiction. But it's true that there is, under the overall Earthching, United Nations Convention on Law of the Sea, a plethora of jurisdictional rights, institutions, and specific frameworks that have been set up to organize the use of oceans. But there are problems of coordination, of implementation, of enforcement, overlapping, and many gaps. So we need to address this issue. That's why the European Union uh, has put forward that strategy for our world's oceans with three priority areas and uh, many, many sets of actions. Let me just mention the three most important priority areas. First of all, improving institutional framework. Second, the sustainable management to reduce the human impact on the oceans. And third, investing in knowledge and data for the ocean. So very briefly on the improving the institutional framework, it's about rules for the seas that work for all. To ensure rules are properly implemented and that any regulatory gaps are filled. For instance, covering gaps in the current United Nations framework and more to protect biodiversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. On sustainable management to reduce human impact, the European Union announced a step up work with international partners to agree on joint action to mitigate climate change and restore marine and coastal systems. Uh, on investing in knowledge and data for the ocean, uh, namely protecting the fish stocks for the future, the European Union agreed to fight illegal, unreported, and, and uh, um, um, unreported fishing. Uh, and the European Union has already been applying both electronic tools to monitor vessels and also market mechanisms for traceability. And it is increasing the supervision of its fishing fleet uh, abroad. It will also uh, promote uh, international action to identify vessels wherever they operate. Uh, because as we know, at least 15% of catches worldwide are estimated to be illegal. Towards there are many other sectors of actions, I will not go in detail, working together for the for the oceans, the national and parks, namely planning of sea space on a global level uh, by 2025. Uh, that's a very interesting idea of the national ocean parks that are being developed. The safety and security of uh, high seas, many initiatives that have been taken by Greece, some of them quite successfully, namely in the East side of Africa, and also mapping the deep, uh, namely building on the success of the European Union Blue Data Network. That uh, is a, a co cooperation of more than 100 research institutions that share uh, information on an open platform about this uh, blue uh, data. Now, 
And there is a specific issue, and I'd like to conclude with a very specific point, because I think it's uh, sometimes better to have a specific conclusion on plastic. The European Union is now considering to have a European Union-wide plastic tax, also because being of own resource for the future of the, um, of the financial perspective, the European Union budget for the next seven years. There is a discussion that's not yet agreed, but I think it's time for the European Union to agree on that tax on plastic. And then I just want to share with you something I've read recently. It's a book uh, about sea power, so about geopolitics, by a retired American Admiral, James Stavridis, a brilliant, let's say, military commander. He was a supreme allied commander of global operations at NATO. But let me share with you what he said. It was, he found out in 1981, when uh, he was le living five years at sea on a destroyer, an aircraft career, and he became, uh, he came to the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. He said the following, and he, said, he was very candidly. Beginning with, and now I quote, beginning with my graduation from Annapolis, where we never studied or thought about the environment in any of my classes, this was 1981, I reported to my ships and blissfully watched our engineers pump dirty bulk water full of black oil over the side with impunity. We had dumped completely uninspected garbage into the oceans within visual distance of the coasts. And we have filled the oceans with plastic, toxins, medical waste, slightly radi radioactive materials, and all manner of utterly unsafe products. I certainly did think of myself as a global lawbreaker. Everything I just mentioned was normal underway operations. If I thought about it at all, I would have reflected that the oceans are a huge place. They seem to be able to re re regenerate themselves. And nothing we were doing was anything other than the way we always did it. End of quote. So today, uh, Admiral uh, Stavridis, I want to make it clear, is an advocate against climate change and for sustainability, but it shows what was the mentality in 81 and what is still the mentality today in some sectors. So I think if we want to make a concrete progress, no. namely the Union, we should now fight this plastic pollution and not only plastic pollution and give concrete examples that we can, in practical terms, achieve some results while we keep uh, in mind, of course, our overarching goals. I thank you very much for your attention, and I wish all success to this summit. Thank you so much, His Excellency. That was really fantastic. I actually just learned a lot, and I appreciate everything you said. Uh, a couple things that jumped out to me. Thank you. For mentioning small island developing states, it's really important that we acknowledge them and their role along with other coastal communities. Um, thank you for talking about international coastal government, so important, and I didn't know about the tax on plastic. So that learned a lot myself and I'm sure everyone did and there's been some questions rolling in the chat that we would like to bounce back to you during the Q&A session uh, later today. So really appreciate your presentation and I would like to uh, now invite our youth speakers for session one. Uh, to join. Uh, so this is Caroline and Lauren Sandberg. Uh, thank you so much. You will both uh, combined have five minutes for your presentation. Thank you so much for having us today. We're very excited to be speaking here. Um, my name is Caroline Sandberg and this is my sister Lauren and we live in Lake Tahoe near California. Two years ago I co-founded an environmental club at my school um, with my friend Summer who's the MC today. In our club, we started out by brainstorming projects we could work on, and consistently we kept coming across this one prominent issue of single-use plastics in restaurants. We live in a small ski town, and so, and there's tons of tourists that come up every year, and so the restaurants are a huge industry, and the plastics in the restaurants are a big problem. We decided to start a, a group called the Eco Eaters, which is a youth-led organization to help restaurants reduce their single-use plastics and replace them with a recyclable or a compostable option. Our group soon expanded outside of school and my sister joined us. And we've had one main success so far, which is we have 
um, had, there's a Thai restaurant in our town, which we have helped convert from um, styrofoam takeout boxes to a compostable takeout box instead. And we've also had lots of smaller successes. Um, where we've talked to lots of restaurants in our area as well, and they've all um, got on board with us in the summer. We're going to help them um, with our, like we're going to help them change over to a more compostable option like we did the Thai restaurant. So this was a smaller success. It's still a start and we're very excited to keep going. Um, other success or other pro or groups that we've worked with is we've placed in a nationwide award for our project and we've spoken at two international conferences about it. At the most recent international conference, the World Sustainable Development Forum, we joined Pop Oceans and that's why we're speaking here today. Yeah, um, at first it might not seem that our project even relates to the ocean, but in fact they can be very intertwined. Eco Eaters aims to eliminate single-use plastics in restaurants, and plastic pollution is a huge problem not just in the whole world, but in our world's oceans specifically. About 8 million tons of plastic goes into the ocean every year, which is the same as placing five garbage bags of trash on every foot of coastline of our planet. This means that not one square mile of surface ocean anywhere on Earth is free of plastic pollution. You might be wondering how plastic even ends up in the ocean in the first place, especially from somewhere that is far inland, like where we live in the mountains. But even if you live hundreds of miles away from the coast, the plastic you throw away could end up in the ocean. And once the plastic is in the ocean, it decomposes very slowly. It breaks down into tiny pieces called microplastics, which can really harm and even kill sea life. There are three main ways that the plastic we use daily ends up in the seas. And the first one is simply throwing plastic into the garbage when it could be recycled. The plastic you throw away in a bin goes to a landfill. And when this garbage is being transported to the landfill, the plastic is often blown away because it is so lightweight. From there, it can eventually clutter around drains, enter rivers, and then eventually the oceans. The second main way is littering, which is perhaps the most obvious because litter on beaches is easily washed into the oceans. But litter on the street doesn't stay there either. Rainwater and wind can carry the plastic waste into streams and rivers, through drains, and then those drains lead to the oceans. The third main one is products that go down the drains. And I think that this is one that people don't really consider all the time because it's not as obvious. Many of the products that we use daily are flushed down toilets, including wet wipes and cotton buds. Even washing our clothes in the washing machine can be harmful because microfibers are released into water, waterways. And these microfibers are too small to be filled, filtered out by wastewater plants. They end up being eaten by small marine species and then they can eventually end up even in our food chain. So whether we mean to litter or not, there's always the chance that the plastic we throw away could make it into the sea. So as you can see from the mountains, we're trying to reduce single use plastics that can go in the ocean. This means that from any part of the world you are, whether it's on the oceans or not, you can help reduce pollution in our oceans. Also, at any age, you can make a difference. The youth are the ones that will suffer the consequences um, from unhealthy oceans, but plastic harms all of us. Big, big changes start with small steps. So even if you're simply just reducing your own single-use plastics at home, or signing petitions, or voting for the right people, this can have a global impact overall. Thank you so much for having us here today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carolyn and Lauren. That was such a great presentation. Thank you for sharing your project. And you are right. Everyone and anyone can make a difference. This is our world. This is all of our world. So we all have to jump in and do what we can and not wait for somebody else to do it. So I think that's a really, if anything, that's an incredibly important point. So I want to just genuinely thank all the speakers from session one, why is why the ocean, uh, Your Excellency Amin, Your Excellency uh, Jose Manuel Barroso, Caroline and Lauren Sandberg. This has been a fantastic session. I've certainly learned a lot and I know everyone else has. And we have some really amazing questions coming in the Q&A that we have noted to answer later. So thank you very much. With that, I will give the, um, the presentation back to Summer. Summer? Thank you, Marisa. And all of our distinguished speakers as well. It's so great to hear how many different perspectives are represented today. Okay, we are going to continue on with our second session of the day. This session is called Health and the Ocean. This session will explore general information about the relationship between the health of the ocean and the human health. It will also discuss the impact of climate change on ocean health and pertinent linkages 
between the ocean and the current COVID-19 pandemic. The moderator for this session will be Vita Wade of Montserrat, an ocean advocate and founder of Fish and Fins. The speakers include His Excellency Lawrence Gondai, former Prime Minister of Malta. His Excellency Lawrence Gondai led Malta during its first nine years as a member of the European Union, transforming the island nation into a modern dynamic European country. Also, His Excellency Jose Ramos Horta, former Prime Minister of East Timor, National Peace Laureate and internationally known peacemaker. And finally, the youth speaker for this event is Anna Hanhausen, ocean advocate with Plastic Oceans Mexico and Pop Ocean, and recipient of the prestigious Medal of Merit from Mexico Congress. Thank you for joining us. Vita, could you please begin the session? Vita, if you can hear me, we are ready for you to begin moderating. Okay, hello. I was actually just muted. I think I'm on now. If everybody can hear you, hear me. My name is Vita Wade and I'm honored to join you from the tiny Caribbean island of Montserrat. Um, from here, I run a kids ocean club called Fish and Fins and I am absolutely delighted to join in this discussion with so many incredible and distinguished individuals um, who genuinely remind me, um, being from a, a small island with only 4,500 people, the capacity to actually forward change, positive change for our ocean's health when you have very strong, courageous and, um, and good partnerships throughout the world. Um, that being said, I, I want to welcome uh, our excellencies, Your Excellency uh, Lawrence Gonzi, Your Excellency or His Excellency Jose Ramos Horta, and the wonderful Anna Hans Han Harson. Um, these are, are going to be our guests for this uh, next discussion. We are going to be looking at the, pros the perspectives, the insights and, and actions that are necessary and um, you know, what we're looking at together in regards to the, the link between the ocean and ocean health. So that being said, we have first up His Excellency Lawrence Gonzi. And if you are ready, uh, sir, we, I would like to open the discussion up to you. Thank you very much, uh, Vita. I hope you're uh... Uh, hearing me clearly, all of you, uh, warm greetings from the island of Malta. For those of you um, who have never been to my country, like yours, Vita, ours is a small island in the middle of the Mediterranean, on the south side, close to Italy. We are a member of the European Union, and uh, it was a pleasure for me to see Jose Manuel Barroso, because when I was Prime Minister, he was President of the European Commission, so we were meeting regularly around the table of the European Union. And our greetings to him, as well as greetings to all the friends that I have noticed that are participating, whom I last met last March in, in Durango, in Mexico, when uh, um, Ash Pashauri and, and some of you organized the uh, World Sustainable Development Forum there, and it was an opportunity to discuss a lot of issues related to climate change, but, the, but, but also some focus on the importance of the ocean. You will obviously all understand how important it is, well, how the ocean is important for everybody, but for an island such as mine, where our livelihood, our quality of life, our survival depends on the sea that surrounds us, you will understand how important this is for all of us, from all aspects. I will come back to this point later on. I do not um, intend to give you a lot of details about statistics, etc. I am not a scientist. I am a lawyer by profession. I was in politics for 30 years. And I can give you my perspective as a politician um, with respect to this particular issue. So I, 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 I need to put four points in brief to you. First, we are discussing, of course, the, the importance of the ocean and putting it within the context of our health and the health of the ocean itself. Now, this is curious because the context in which we are all meeting um, today is a context uh, which is very special. Probably the world has never seen anything like this before. We have just, uh, and still are some of us, going through a lockdown situation. The whole world came to a stop. The whole world decided, decided to take a decision that had never been taken before. Shut down completely. Why? Because of the pandemic because of a virus that has threatened our health. 
Now, I am impressed because this proves that when we really want to do something about, about an issue, we can really do something extraordinary. But you see, what worries me is with the pandemic, with the COVID-19, there is always the hope that there will be a vaccine in the short term. But hang on, what about our planet? What about the climate change? What about our ocean and the disaster we saw at the beginning of the, the, this, this, this virtual forum with the feature presented to us by Sir David Attenborough? Shouldn't we panic even more about the state we are in today and the state we have brought our oceans on which we depend so much? Um, I keep reminding myself when reading about this matter that you know, life on our planet started from the ocean. Life started from the sea around us. I am scared that we are, if we don't do something and we don't do it urgently, then life will end because of our ocean, because we have uh, condemned our ocean to become what it is slowly becoming um, a, a major challenge that needs to be addressed. So we need to put our discussion today within this context and understand that we cannot continue to take the oceans for granted. We're surrounded by it, some of us, and we seem to be taking it for granted, thinking that it will remain there forever. Whereas we should be taking urgent action on this first point. Second point, our future depends on what we're going to do about our ocean. I noticed during the chat that went on, um, while there were the other speakers, uh, there, was, there was one particular question which puts a challenge to us. And he said, okay, but, but, but what, are, what, what are we going to do about this? If it is true that our future uh, as human beings depends on the health of our oceans, because we, it, is, it, 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 it impacts complete, our complete lifestyle uh, and our, our uh, survival, then what do we do about this? So, so, so let's understand that our future depends very much, not just on us talking about this issue, but on actual concrete action that need to be taken. It was a pleasure listening to uh, Jose Manuel Barroso. I will um, refer you just please, please, I, 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 um, I invite you to look up the most recent studies uh, and reports carried out by the European Union. The, the latest one I have available is, is, is dated 2019. It is titled Improving International Ocean Governance. It's a, it's a very short report, but clearly lays down some important uh, steps that can be taken on a global, on a regional, on a national level. And I think the young generation, if there is nothing that they can do, they can speak out. They can push their politicians to try and do something about this. Let us not just uh, resign ourselves to the fact that we are communicating via Zoom or via Facebook or via, the, the pressure needs to be put on the decision takers and the decision makers. Um, the, that was my second point. So that's our future. The third point is a little bit of a positive point. Um, again, linking, linked to what, uh, what I was saying earlier on with respect to the um, uh, pandemic, with respect to the virus. You know, we have learned some lessons in these two months. Uh, I am 66 years of age, but the lessons I've learned in these last two months, I've never learned in 66 years. You know, and one of the lessons is that when we really decide to do something about our environment, our climate, things do change. I'll give you one example. Um, I did not want to take up too much of your time, but um, I, 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 I wanted to put up a, a photo, I have not managed, of our free port. Malta has some beautiful harbors. One of them is a free port. Now you can imagine what happens in a free port. Ships coming in and out, containers in and out. The condition of the harbor where the free port is, is something incredible. You know what happened in these past two months? For the first time in, in, in I don't know how many years, we saw dolphins swimming in the harbor where we have our free port. Now, that, that, that all the Maltese population were, were flabbergasted. They were surprised. They were happy by the fact that we saw dolphins swimming into our harbor, which, is, which, which so, for so many years was taken over completely by the industrial um, uh, operation that is taking there. So, so, so this does change. And nature itself answers, uh, speaks out, in fact, uh, and tells us clearly what needs to be done, what has to be done, and what the results will be. So that, that's, that's, that's a, a message of hope. 
We have, we have learned, therefore, that small changes in our everyday lifestyle can bring about some dramatic and astonishing changes. This is also the message that they, Sir David Attenborough uh, put to us in his, in his, in his brief um, presentation at the beginning of this, uh, of this uh, forum. Clearly, the ocean is, is, is today um, with less pollution. We see species reappearing in areas that had once been abandoned, and our ecosystems are healthier. So in any way, uh, you, you know what I'm trying to say. If we really put our mind to it, if we, if we really decide that this needs to be done, then for heaven's sake, let's do it because we can actually save this blessed planet. Uh, planet. Finally, my fourth point. Um, when I was in Mexico in, in last March, in, and, and I was scheduled to give my speech in Durango, that same morning, I had my radio on and I was listening to the BBC uh, radio news. And they had just announced on that same day that uh, some researchers had discovered in the deepest part of our ocean, uh, and this is in the, um, uh, the Mariana Trench, which is close to seven kilometers deep, huh? they had discovered um, a species which they had not been aware of before. And they examined this species. And you know what? They found small uh, uh, molecules of plastic present in this species. And they decided, in fact, to call it uh, Eurythines plasticus. My point here is that even if at that very deep part of our oceans, plastic has managed to reach even at that depth, and, and even species down there are, 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 are presenting these, these, these symptoms, then clearly this is a major issue. And I will conclude on this. We can, take, we can make a list of a thousand different initiatives, but I hang on, I, I, I ride on to the points made earlier. Let us take plastic as a majority, as a priority for us. Let us put plastic as a priority. And you know what? We can put pressure so that we will go back to recycled um, glass bottles instead of plastic bottles. Bottles that can be washed, cleaned, and reused. Let us put plastic to the side. Let us remove it from our daily use. Let us go for alternatives that will help us keep our oceans clean. If we do this, there's much more that can be done. But if we want to take one single project where we can really make a difference, both personally, but also on a national level, then plastic should be our, our, our priority. Thank you very much, all of, our, all of you. It was a pleasure participating. I wish you success and keep strong. Thank you so much, uh, His Excellency uh, Gonzi. You, you said so many different things that really, um, you know, really spoke to me as well uh, about giving our ocean a chance to restore itself. And if you leave the natural environment to itself, then it has that huge potential. But, you know, in the meantime, what do we do? We need to be working on action. And I think one of the messages that came through to me was the need for urgent action, just as we have dealt with the coronavirus, and not a spirit of complacency, but a spirit of urgency. And um, I hear that message loud and clear. Um, and, you know, it was, it was really good as well to hear your, um, your emphasis on our next generation and the part um, we and they can play in in actually advocating, um, which is really the purpose of, of what our pop family are, are intending to do. So His Excellency, thank you so much. And um, I, I could even maybe share a little bit with some of those who are um, listening in that, you know, I'm not a politician at all, but last year I ran in our election and that was because I really wanted to raise the voice and conversations around ocean um, health and wellness. Um, and I, I, I too share in that, um, His Excellency, in that there is those young people who are listening that want to advocate and raise their voices. And I, I think on one perspective, yes, we can push, put pressure on the decision makers. And on the other perspective, we can also become the decision makers so you know really grateful for that insight um especially from another person in a small island uh developing state where plastics uh, you know are ravaging our shores in places too um and not often the even the plastics that we have um used ourselves 
But um, so a great thank you to you. I thoroughly enjoyed that session and I'm sure many others have as well. Um, next, I would like to invite His Excellency Jose Ramos Horta, um, President or former President of East of uh, Timor Leste and Nobel, Nobel Peace, Peace Prize winner in 1996. So um, His Excellency, if you're with us and you're um, I, I believe actually, if I remember correctly, we, we anticipated some issues with regards to connectivity and we have got a pre-recorded um, statement, uh, presentation from His Excellency uh, Romas Hota. Uh, can we go ahead and run that? Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. While we're waiting for that um, video to to launch. I'm not sure if we're experiencing some connectivity issues, but um, Dr. Dr. Jose Ramos Horta will be with us, and I think he still is with us. So if you have questions at the end of his presentation, uh, please send them into the chat. I think that video is rolling Hello, now. All of you who are tuning in to this uh, exceptionally important uh, event on oceans. Uh, warmest greetings to all of you. I hope wherever you are, uh, stay safe with your uh, closest uh, family, relatives, uh, friends in your uh, communities. Uh, I have to start with the good news from my country, Timor-Leste. We, right now, we have a zero uh, reported infection for the last uh, month now. We do not have a, a single reported confirmed coronavirus, uh, COVID-19 infection. We had uh, 28, of which 24 were imported from Indonesia, Timorese uh, students who were living in Indonesia and in return were diagnosed with uh, COVID-19. Uh, several uh, foreigners, nationalities, all have recovered, confirmed they have done a necessary double test to confirm that they are negative. We do not have uh, any community transmission. But we are continuing with a reasonable, not excessive uh, prevention uh, measures. So far, uh, so good. Zero case uh, in uh, Timor-Leste. Of course, the international media does not report it because the international media, as usual, point to countries like New Zealand and others, Western countries, uh, only Western countries uh, supposedly know how to uh, do good, and we all miserable, isolated, small island states, we don't know how to look after ourselves. But I have to say, the good news is that uh, we right now have a zero uh, COVID-19 case. The other good news from this part of the world, Timor-Leste, is that we are part of the so-called Coral Triangle. The Coral Triangle comprises Timor-Leste, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, Malaysia and the Philippines. More than 100 million people depend on the health of the coral system in the Coral Triangle region for their livelihood. And the good news is Timor-Leste has the healthiest undamaged, unbleached coral system. In addition to this great news, scientists from Australia and elsewhere have identified I think this video has just paused a little bit, so let's give it a couple minutes and see if it starts to flow again. Situated right in the middle between the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean. The Pacific Ocean 
flow into the Indian Ocean and the currents of cold water bathe the whole island of Timor-Leste from different sides. So in spite of global warming, uh, we do not have any, have detected any damage uh, as a result of global warming on our corals. Uh, photographers, scientists, filmmakers who have been here in recent months, they have reported that they have never seen anything like that in the world. Riches, biodiversity, and damaged, unbleached coral life. We are a population of a bit over 1.3 million. Timor-Leste is part of the so-called least developed countries. We are part of the so-called fragile states. Timor-Leste actually with Sierra Leone, with Liberia, we are the leaders of the G7 plus small fragile countries. And we are doubly impacted by climate change. We are impacted by the global warming, rising sea levels, but also the unpredictable, unstable weather patterns. It can rain in our country, start supposedly October, November, but it can start only in January of this year, and it goes on till May. We still have had very strong rains, which make life difficult for farmers and for fishermen. The connection between the health of the oceans and the health of human beings is so obvious. When we look, for instance, at the radiation levels as a result of the tsunami in Japan that damaged the Fukushima nuclear power, it affected, uh, increased the level of radiation in the seas near Japan and uh, beyond. Any dumping of uh, waste, hospital waste dumped by Western countries, particularly from Europe, that collect hospital waste and dump in the Indian Ocean. Cruise ships that dump waste into the vast oceans Plastics that are done by many people, including our own, including the hundreds of millions of people in Asia region that purchase plastic, not only plastic bags, but everything that contains plastic and don't know how to discard, how to recycle, dump in rivers, and the, the floods come and wash the plastic into the ocean. One immediate consequence, it poison the corals, poison the fish, diminish the livelihood, but also it can poison ourselves, those who consume uh, fish, uh, sea uh, resources. Who are responsible? One thing that is extraordinary, as I uh, sometimes look, the things that we, many of us use the other end. Toothpaste, a toothbrush, a carton of uh, milk, or yogurt, or anything. We import it from wherever they are manufactured, elsewhere in Asia or in Australia. We import, we pay for it. We even pay for these things. We pay not for the content, but we pay for the container that uh, cover uh, these products. When we finish the product, we use up the toothpaste, the cream. What we do with it? Well, we dump in our own country. So I understand countries like the Philippines, Malaysia, they decide to send back to uh, Canada, to send back to Australia, all the waste that we get. <laughs> Can you imagine? I cannot understand it. We pay for these damn things. We pay the product, we pay import duties, and then we are the ones who have to live with this product that we pay to you. 
So I would like to say, please come and collect all your garbage here. If I ever go back to the presidency or to my gov to our government, yeah, one legislation I would force to introduce is all the garbage that we collect, either someone, a rich Western country foundation, set up here a uh, recycling uh, so that we can recycle and transform it into whatever, into uh, energy or into uh, fertilizers, I don't know. Or, I'm sorry, but we will put on a boat and send back to you. Before I end my uh, contribution today, I would like first um, to pay tribute to the Pashauri family. To you, Dr. Ash, and your entire family for continuing uh, the legacy of your father who started this um, uh, wall. Uh, <coughs> Uh, sustainable uh, development uh, forum that bring us uh, to discuss, to share ideas about to, uh, the state of our world. Second, the COVID pandemic that uh, shattered lives around the world. Tens of millions of people uh, have been impoverished, hundreds of millions have been impoverished, many hundreds of thousands uh, uh, killed and died as a result of it. The global uh, recession that impacted the lives of all of us. Many of us, most of us who uh, are at the receiving end of this pandemic, these and other pandemics over which we poor countries have a little control and a little say. I wish to end by appealing to the rich and the powerful of the world. At least for once, at least for once, do not be so insensitive, so greedy. Pharmaceutical companies, governments, make sure that any vaccine or cure to prevent coronavirus, COVID-19, or to treat, it is made available for free. First, for the least developed countries, LDCs, for the fragile states, and for developing countries, and maybe in the West, because you are more affluent, Maybe your governments can subsidize so that the companies that have invested, produced, may uh, recover some of the investments. But for once in our lifetime, in your lifetime, show wisdom and the solidarity. Do not argue over who should have uh, the intellectual property over it and how much to profit from it, but rather how many lives you can save. I thank you and God bless you all. God bless us all. Thank you very much. Um, I hope you are all still hearing me. Um, thank you very much, His Excellency Jose Ramos Hota. That was um, such a, a, a really refreshing presentation. You're um, very straightforward, very candid, and um, I think all of us enjoyed and appreciated that. Um, and I think that's exactly the type of honest um, you know, dialogue that we need to have as we, we aim towards finding very real solutions and actions. Um, you, you, you really ended on that point of the moral leadership and how important moral leadership is for our uh, small island developing states, um, our fragile economies, um, our citizens and our, our children and grandchildren's futures. Um, so thank you so much. Um, it's my understanding that it's about uh, 1 a.m. in Timor Leste. So we unfortunately won't have His Excellency for question and answer, but you're still invited to pop your questions in and um, I'm sure our technical teams will do their very best to have them answered and sent to you. Um, so that being said, our final uh, speaker is the very bright and very talented um, Anna Hanhausen from Pop Ocean, Plastic Oceans, Mexico. 
And we're very privileged to have her um, being a part of our discussion on the link between the ocean and our health. So with that being said, I would like to invite um, Miss Anna Hansen to present. Anna? Hello, everyone. <laughs> yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, Over perfect. to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Veda, for the introduction. So, as I was researching about this topic, about the relationship between the health of the o and the ocean, I realized that they're more closely related than I had realized. Not only do we have ocean species that have helped in medical discoveries, but the effects of, hu of human action on the ocean affect the ocean's health, and this in turn affects our health. A clear example of this is pollution. Chemical pollution, for example, such as oil spills, kills thousands of species. It's estimated that the 2010 BP oil spill pushed overfished species closer to the brink of extinction. And also people in close contact with these oil spills have shown physical and mental negative effects. Also, the effect of chemical pollution on fish and shellfish result in food shortages that can put in danger many small communities. Another example and a very common and big example is plastic pollution. A recent study found that we had underestimated the amount of microplastics that we have in our ocean. In 2019, a study found that there's up to 8.3 million pieces of microplastics per square meter of the ocean. The issue is so serious that even plankton have been found to have microplastics in their systems. As we eat seafood, toxic chemicals from microplastics ingested by the fish go into our system and this can cause autoimmune system suppression, birth defects, and endocrine disruption. Also, estimates calculate that we eat up to a credit card worth of plastic each week. So I think that really puts into perspective how much um, of the plastic we put into the oceans is affecting us as well. The current pandemic is, expect is expected to worsen the pollution issue as only 1% of the face masks used are disposed of correctly. Already, thousands of gloves, gowns, and face masks have been washing up on the shores, highlighting the deficient waste management plans that exist today. However, COVID-19 does not only pose a threat to our oceans, it's also an opportunity. COVID-19 has shown us that if an issue is taken seriously enough, changes can and will happen. Extraordinary measures have been taken as the World Health Organization named the virus a pandemic, and countries around the world established it as an emergency, indirectly causing a drastic decrease in greenhouse gas emissions. If the climate emergency is treated as, as such, we can reduce carbon emissions to a point where positive effects start becoming evident in our marine ecosystems. It's also important to mention that not doing anything to mi mitigate climate change will result in a bigger economic crisis than the one we're already approaching because of the virus. As I mentioned earlier, bacteria have been widely studied for medical use. However, only 90, 80 to 95% of our oceans remain unexplored. This opens up many possibilities to new scientific findings that link our dependence on the healthy oceans even further. Finally, as part of the youth speakers, I'd like to point out how the youth across the world have become drivers of change. We recognize the importance of caring for our planet and the right the next generations have to a healthy and resilient ecosystem. This is why it's a responsibility to make the right decisions and change our consumption patterns to buy products that aren't harmful to the environment. On the other side, we need to stay informed on, on what is happening right now. So we know what scientists state as a course of action to be taken, and we can join environmental efforts to achieve the necessary goals. Thank you very much. I, I hope all this information was a helpful insight on what is going on and the relationship between human health and the health of the ocean. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. That was, that was truly fantastic. And your presentation, I'm sure, has, um, you know, has, has touched me in terms of um, your, your knowledge and dedication. And it's certainly definitely a sign of great hope for our Thank future. You know, and so that brings us to the the end of our um, our session on the uh, our health and our ocean. Um, I I hope you're still hearing me. I'm hearing a little bit of interference in the background, but um, I just wanted to say again a huge thank you to all of our um, distinguished guests. Again, um, His Excellency Lawrence Gonzi, 
former Prime Minister of Malta. Um, we will remember the need for urgent action and not complacency. Um, and His Excellency Jose Ramos Ahota, former President of East Timor and Nobel Prize winner. I'm sure many of us would love to visit your country to enjoy some of that marine biodiversity. And, and do remember that if you, if you ever get to sort out the, um, the waste um, and shipping them back, please visit the Caribbean islands as well. And you can tell them to stop off at Montserrat. We very much will appreciate that. Um, so again, from the pop, pop Ocean family, a huge thank you um, for all of our participants in this session. And I'm, I'm passing it over to now to our next moderator, uh, Dr. Sivilla, and she'll be discussing the ocean and the economy. So from me, thank you so much. And happy Ocean Day, everybody. Thank you so much, Vida, for moderating that incredibly informative panel. And thank you to all of our distinguished speakers. I just want to quickly remind all of the participants to keep your microphone muted just so we can hear our speakers clearly. And also, um, if you want to post this on uh, this event on social media, we encourage that. Um, tagging hashtag pop ocean action, hashtag climate action now and hashtag World Ocean Day. With that, let's continue on to the third and final session today, which is the ocean and the economy. During this session, we will deliberate on the economic implications of ocean-related environmental issues. The blue economy and blue ecology will be discussed while exploring sustainable marine and coastal tourism as a livelihood. These issues will be discussed in the context of climate change, climate justice, justice excuse me, and the impact of sea level rise on the global economy. The moderator for this session will be Dr. Norma Patricia Munoz Sevilla, chairperson of the Climate Change Council of the Mexican Republic. The speakers include His Excellency Mike Rand, former longstanding premier of South Australia, Minister for Sustainability and Climate Change, and national president of the Australian Labour Party. Also, Her Excellency Martha Delgado Peralta, under Secretary for Multilateral Affairs and Human Rights of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Mexico. Dr. Shonali Pachuri, Acting Director of the Transitions to New Technologies Program and Senior Research Scholar with the Energy Program at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis in Austria. Sir David King, the UK government's former Chief Scientific Advisor, he founded the Center for Climate Repair at Cambridge, a global research and development hub in order to realize the goal of moving beyond decarbonization by researching and funding technologies to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And finally, the youth speaker, Maria Jaquez, president of a student environmental association called Cambio Ibero. Dr. Norma, I will give you the floor now to please begin the session. Okay, Summer, thank you so much. Can you hear me? Yes, we can yeah. hear you. Okay. okay. Thank you so much. Welcome to everybody to this uh, important session that um, is related to the issue of the economy. We heard already uh, for our speakers that the economy is very important just now to keep a, a healthy ocean. In this session, uh, the blue economy and the blue ecology will be very important for us. We will discuss with our speakers, brilliant speakers that we have today uh, in this session, how it works, the economy, how it works, the ecology, and how we can work in a blue way for this important ecosystem in our world. Uh, I would like to warmly welcome Ms. Marta Delgado, Dr. Shonali Pachori, Dr. Mike Rand, Sir David King, and Maria Jax for this important session. Please, uh, I will give the floor to Dr. Mike Rand. Doctor, for you the floor, please. Hello. Um, I'm very delighted to be here, and it's an honor to be a patron of the World Sustainable Development Forum. And also, I'm delighted to be to participate in this POP uh, Oceans Virtual Summit. So pleased to be working again with young people. And I have to say it was a, a pleasure just a few months back to join Ash, uh, Lawrence Gonzi, 
And so many of the people I have seen along the way today at, at Durango, I thought it was a magnificent conference. And, uh, and I think that it was important, uh, I thought important for me to talk about the international work of the climate group with subnational governments and major corporations, and also the Sustainable Markets Initiative led by the Prince of Wales and the World Economic Forum. And, and Ash and I were linked up uh, with that uh, just a few days ago. But there's no doubt that the oceans are the lifeblood of our international economy. So let me give you a couple of examples. I'm from a fairly large island, Australia. We have massive, a massive tourism industry. So let me give you a couple of examples. And so much large, of our um, attraction for visitors focuses on our marine environment and 16,000 mile coastline. So much we have world famous attractions like the World Heritage listed Great Barrier Reef, which is more than 1400 miles long. It's the biggest uh, uh, coral reef system in the world, larger in area than the UK, Switzerland and Holland combined. And there's also of course our beaches, 10,000 of them. So that's critically important for um, for tourism. And then there's Australia's uh, trade with 99% of our exports carried by ships across the oceans to destinations around the world. The shipping industry is responsible for carrying 90% of the world's overseas trade. About 50,000 cargo ships uh, uh, including the carry uh, exports, affordable food and manufactured goods, plus the bulk transport of raw materials. And without them, uh, this trade would not be possible. There is also, of course, the crucial role of oceans in providing food. A few years back, I was Australia's permanent representative to the Food and Agriculture Organization, and also the UN's World Food Programme. Fish and seafood are basic components in the diets. Our oceans support a harvest comprised of around 94 million tons of fish caught by the commercial fishing industry and 63 million tons from aquaculture. So given this importance, why do we treat our oceans as if they were giant septic tanks, sewers rather than the lifeblood of sustenance and connectivity. And we've heard today about how we take our oceans for granted, treating them as an infinite resource to be used with impunity. We've also heard how we've assaulted our oceans on multiple fronts. David Attenborough, as you pointed out, has said that we now face the consequences of this maltreatment. But the International Panel on Climate Change tells us that global warming could mean sea levels, levels rising by more than a metre by the end of the century, affecting the lives of a billion people in countries large and small with devastating effects. There'll be a massive impact on the 680 million people living in low level coastal zones, as well as the 65 living on small island developing nations. These people will be especially at risk from a combination of flooding, increasing storms and other weather events so extreme that they used to be seen as happening once every century but could become once a year occurrences by 2050. Now this of course will result not only in a massive loss of life, of homes and infrastructure, but will also have a colossal impact in terms of feeding and providing shelter for millions of dispossessed people for treating the sick during co the consequent health crises, as well as the cost of recovery, reconstruction, and lost agricultural production. So the economic consequences, as well as the human cost, will be absolutely massive. The threat to small island Pacific countries of sea level rise has been eloquently highlighted by New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern, and I hope at some stage we can involve her in one of our, our forums. She, even for New Zealand, 19 billion of its assets are at risk from sea level rise and flooding events, including five airports, 2,000 kilometers of road, 
40,000 at homes. But Prime Minister Ardern speaks passionately about how climate change is impacting on Pacific Island states. These tiny nations contribute very little to global carbon emissions, but they are already amongst the first to experience the impact of warming and rising seas. Jacinda points out that it's not only storms that threaten Pacific countries, as devastating as they've been and will continue to be. There's also salt water intrusion from the sea into precious freshwater sources. Staple crops like taro have been devastated in some island coastal areas, with some aquifers at risk of becoming undrinkable and unfit to use on crops. She also points out that the increasing warming and acidification is changing the chemistry of seawater, threatening the habitats of marine life important for local diets. So, of course, the threat, as we've heard, to our oceans is not just from rising and warming sea levels and acidification. It's also about pollution. We've also already heard about the massive plastic uh, pollution with 8 million tonnes of plastic being dumped into the seas each year. Prince Charles has said that we are close to the point where whatever wild-caught fish we eat will contain plastic. And horrifyingly, people who eat seafood are ingesting 11,000 pieces of microplastic a year. Now, disgracefully, we've heard of vast islands of debris, including plastic that have become floating garbage dumps. Just one of them in the Pacific is, is estimated to contain 18 trillion pieces of trash and cover an area that the size of Texas. Now, going back to Australian tourism, the iconic barrier reef that I mentioned earlier is now under increasing threat. David Attenborough said the most vivid impact he's witnessed of the changing climate was revisiting the Great Barrier Reef. He said that upon first visiting the reef in the 1950s, he'd enjoyed the extraordinary experience of diving and suddenly seeing this multitude of fantastic, beautiful forms of life. But when revisiting the reef just a decade ago, he observed instead of multitudes of wonderful forms of life, I was struck by how much it was bleached white because of rising temperatures and increasing acidity in the seas. So I guess the question is, what is to be done in terms of bringing the economic and environmental importance of our oceans into balance? First of all, it starts with us as individuals. Do we continue to embrace or do we discard our own throwaway convenience culture. What is happening to our planet is not someone else's problem. It's yours and mine in whatever countries we live. And it begins with our lifestyles. Are we doing enough to limit what we consume and throw away? Do we still buy water in plastic bottles, even if we live in communities where the water supply is safe? Are we, are we still using plastic plates, knives, forks, and straws? Do we still patronize cafes where they use plastic containers that are immediately thrown away and discarded? Are we active enough politically through environmental groups or political parties to argue the case for greater urgency in reducing emissions? Now we've all, one of the messages I wanna get across to everyone is all of us have to vote and encourage others to do so and vote out leaders who are climate deniers and uh, who actively and deliberately frustrate agreements on reducing carbon emissions. There's an election coming up in November somewhere where it would be a very, very good start. Now, much of the focus has been on the policies of national governments, but however, we mustn't neglect the importance of encouraging action by sub-national governments, who are often way ahead of their national counterparts in achieving positive change. In the US, Australia and Brazil, for instance, there are many states getting on with world leading climate action, despite their national governments who act like glove puppets of the fossil fuel industry. And as an Australian, I'm absolutely ashamed of the role of the current government in what it did at the last COP meeting to frustrate action. So subnational governments can have even a positive impact on the health of our oceans. When I was Premier of South Australia, I announced in 2008 that we'd be the first state in Australia to ban 
non-renewable plastic bags of the type used in supermarkets. This initiative was absolutely denounced by vested interest as unworkable for consumers and retailers alike, and they argued it would cost jobs. That didn't happen. It was instead embraced by the overwhelming majority of shoppers. And I saw one poll that showed 80% support. That ban alone has prevented billions of plastic bags entering the waste stream and getting into rivers and the sea. And we've also got a zero waste uh, pr process and we've also got a container deposit uh, scheme. Again, hundreds of millions of containers that would have been washed away um, are recycled. Now, I'm pleased that other Australian states are now following with similar legislation, and I hope other jurisdictions around the world will join the momentum. And for other plastic products, I hope we see both recycling schemes, but also look at manufacturers who use biodegradable plastic of the type that I understand has been developed here in Britain by Symphony Environmental. We also, in South Australia, introduced a network of 19 marine parks with 83 sanctuary zones stretched along the coastline. These areas, similar in concept to national parks, protect vital fish breeding, feeding, nursery, refuge areas for our fish, other marine animals and plants. So we now have one of the best fisheries management systems in the world, and one of the main purposes of our marine parks is to contribute long-term to replenishing fish stocks outside the zones. At the national level, we need to see countries, particularly vulnerable ones, push much harder through the UN's International Maritime Organization to put climate policies and emission reduction standards higher on its agenda. The IMO's headquarters are here in London. Most people have never heard of it, even though it is the global standard setting authority for the safety, security, and environmental performance of international shipping. It has 172 member states, including countries that are most vulnerable to sea level rise. And I mention this because international shipping is a major polluter, contributing as much CO2 to the atmosphere as a major industrial nation such as Germany. But pressure must be put on the IMO by member countries to agree to tougher emission standards to make shipping more energy efficient and less polluting. We also need international action, this follows on from, from Jose Ramos Horta's mention before, to prevent the practice of developed nations paying developing nations, mainly in Asia, to accept plastic and other waste that is carried by ships and barges across the world to be dumped sometimes illegally. Developing countries must unite to work on the technology to clean up these floating islands of garbage. Now, in to conclude, despite all of this, I remain on most days optimistic. I'm pleased that investors such as major pension funds with trillions of dollars worth of assets, plus some sovereign wealth funds and banks are increasingly divesting or stopping further investments in the fossil fuel industry and instead choosing sustainable investments that they now see as bankable and profitable. And that's what the Sustainable Markets Initiative is about, and we should all support it. The Climate Group, which I'm involved with, now has more than 200 sub-national governments and a similar number of major corporations making measurable commitments to reduce their emissions. And this is also gaining real momentum. So in closing, I hope you put pressure on your respective governments to ensure that any post-COVID-19 recovery packages given to industry are directly linked to sustainable economic outcomes that reduce emissions. We've got to avoid at all costs, repeating what happened uh, after, during and after the global financial crisis when progress on climate action was put on hold. And it's also important to ensure that when governments and corporations proudly tell you that they will have zero emissions by 2050, that they state their measurable short and medium term targets and spell out how they're going to meet them. In the 60s, many countries in Europe, including here in Britain, cleaned up their grossly polluted rivers and air pollution that produced choking smog full of toxic fumes and particles. We, 
can do the same for our seas, which like our forests, are the lungs of our planet, but they're also the producers of much of our food, the focus of much of our tourism and recreation and our vital uh, trade routes. Uh, thank you for listening to me and for allowing me to participate. Dr. Ran, for your very important talk. Uh, that is true that the uh, shipping industry is a big issue, is a big problem around the world. You are completely right. 90% of the trade uh, that are moving uh, on the sea uh, affect a lot, not only your region, but around the world, all regions. It's very important to, to know that not only the industry is affecting the quality of waters or the quality of uh, what we have uh, as uh, production in the sea, also, they, have, they are affecting a lot with, with so many issues like uh, CO2 emissions, chemical pollution, noise pollution that uh, until now with, uh, nobody is uh, talking about the noise pollution that is affecting a lot of marine mammals, the waste in general that you were talking about that, and also the impact of climate change and the global warming on the small island states. That is really very strong, very important, because we saw already in many uh, environmental meetings around the world that the small island, they are suffering a lot with this issue. Thank you so very much. We will uh, speak a little uh, further with uh, all the, the speakers that we have in this panel about this very important issue. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Dr. Rang. And now we give the floor to uh, Her Excellency Marta Delgado, please. Marta, are you there? Marta? Marta Delgado? No? Somewhere we have Marta, somewhere there, please. Hello, Ms. Marta Delgado is just attending a brief uh, phone call. She'll be back in a minute. Okay, we wait some more. Um, yeah. I'm oh. not sure. One minute, uh, she said one minute. Okay, um, also, yeah, if we can take this time, if you have any questions for anyone, please type them in the chat. And also don't forget about posting on social media at um, the pop movement on all the different um, social media platforms. Um, if Marta is not available, I would suggest uh, that if uh, His Excellency Sir David King is available, perhaps we could let him get started. Okay, thank you, Marissa. Uh, Sir David King, are you ready for your talk? Yes, I am. Okay, can, can you take the floor, please? Thank you very much. So let me thank start you so much. By, let me start by saying, in particular, thank you to Ash Pachari for the invitation. I feel very honored to address this uh, critically important meeting. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. thank you. How, how that happened. Okay, so basically a very big thank you to Ash Pachari for inviting me to this critically important meeting uh, and giving me a chance to talk to so many wonderful young people. The future is in your hands and we really need you to act in every possible way to see that we move the, the planet forward in a safer way. So first of all, let me say just something about the, the state of the oceans. The reason why we've just heard Mike Rann talking about the uh, pollution of the oceans is because of our human attitude towards what we call the natural world. So I just want to first of all say, actually, do we treat ourselves as apart from the natural world? <clears throat> Excuse me, apart from the natural world or a part of the natural world? So all of our language at the moment is built around the idea that we are separate, that somehow we are not a part of it. Of course, we co-evolved on this planet. 
with every aspect of that natural world. We are a part of it, but we have pushed ourselves into this position where we feel we are above it all. And this year, with the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we are suffering from not fully understanding our interaction with the, as being part of that natural world. And of course, the bigger threat is from the, the destruction of the oceans in the way that this is continuing. There is no such thing as waste in the natural world until we came along and developed this notion that we can wrap things up and throw them away. In the natural world, everything is recycled. And it's taken us a very long time to learn that critically important business of recycling. I'm delighted to hear that Mike Rand took South Australia into a banning of, of plastic bags, etc. I'm senior strategy advisor to the government of Rwanda, and I'm very pleased to say I believe Rwanda was the first country in the world to ban plastic bags. The, the, the initiation of these exercises need not be in the developed world. They can happen in the emerging economies. Rwanda, first of all, banned plastic bags back in 2010, and now they've banned all single-use plastics. So it's, it's, it's an advance in a, a society that really is gaining in every single way from the respect that people are playing, paying to their environment. Now, of course, what, what I really want to focus on is what, how we can manage to change the situation. I, I refer now to what China did in introducing a new word, I think the English translation is simply eco-civilization. And this was introduced in uh, the Communist Party constitution in 2012 in China. And it's now part of the government constitution in China. And eco-civilization is interpreted as meaning that we develop our well-being alongside the well-being of ecosystems. We can't separate one from the other because actually we're all a part of that ecosystem. Now, until we get that into our heads, that we need to treat ourselves as part of the ecosystems, we will continue using the ecosystems as a, uh, a disposable. Whereas, of course, we totally depend on it, as do all other living creatures. Now, what I, I want to move on to is the, the question of rising sea levels and the question of climate change, because this quite simply is the biggest challenge the world is faced with today. Let's take the, the Arctic Sea. The Arctic Sea is now 50% exposed to sunlight during the Arctic summer every year. And, and that level of exposure is growing. And of course, it never was. There were, there were explorers who walked across to the, to the North Pole. You can't do that anymore. You have to swim there. So what, what, what is this, what's the consequence of this for the rest of the planet? Well, let's just remember that blue sea absorbs sunlight very effectively. White ice reflects it very effectively. So of course, we've now disturbed the planetary climate system by creating a hot spot in the middle of the North Pole in the polar summer. And the result of this is that average through the year, the whole of the Arctic Circle region is now heating up at two and a half times the rate of the rest of the planet. Now, why does this affect every one of us, particularly those who are island nations? And here in Britain, we are indeed also an island nation but also anyone who's living on a city that's at a coastline. 80% of our cities were at coastline. Why, why does it affect all of us? Because sitting in the Arctic Circle is Greenland and Greenland ice is now beginning to melt. And it's also following the same pattern as the Arctic ice. It's, it's following not a linear depletion, but a, a plus linear. In other words, there's a very big positive feedback in the loss of, of the ice from Greenland. And when all of the ice in Greenland melts, sea levels will rise by seven meters. Now that's not gonna happen quickly. It's taken 
hundreds and hundreds of thousands and millions of years to build all that ice up. But at the same time as the Arctic is melting, the Antarctic is becoming destabilized by the warming of the ocean below the, the bits of the Arctic, uh, Antarctic ice that are sitting on the ocean. And we're in danger of seeing very large chunks of ice entering the ocean. And one of these chunks could easily push sea levels up just with one chunk could push the sea levels up by half to one meter. So we're talking about a possibility that we are risking the future of civilization. And the reason I say it as dramatically as that is because moving forward in time, it's not very long before one of the biggest cities in the world, Calcutta in India, is no longer going to be livable because of not just rising sea levels, storms at sea causing the incursion of water further and further inland, and Calcutta is already being flooded quite frequently. When it's flooded every year, then of course you can no longer live there. And across the water from uh, Calcutta is, is Bangladesh. Bangladesh, two thirds of that country is no longer going to be livable. No longer being livable. And as we therefore move forward in time, it's not a long stretch before we get to the position where perhaps 160 million people in that region are looking for somewhere else to live. Where do they go? Does that cause a destabilization in our planetary economic system, in our global living system? Yes, it does. We've now got a taster from COVID-19 of what a destabilization looks like. The economies of the world are in a very peculiar state now. Imagine what Europe has managed with the migration that has occurred from uh, Northern Africa. That, that has destabilized Europe in a very strange way. This, this is caused by a few million refugees. Talk about 150 million, you're looking at a global disaster in a very large scale. Now, the, the problem is we reached a very good agreement in Paris in, in 2015. I think it was a good agreement. We said 1.5 degrees, not two degrees. That was a decision that was made in the, at the Pacific Island Forum. I was there representing Britain, and I managed to push the British government into supporting the islanders in their desire to see 1.5 and not two. We're nowhere near managing the 1.5 degrees. Greenhouse gases are still increasing more rapidly than before. And now it's actually methane that is going up very rapidly. And methane is going up rapidly, largely not because of the methane leakage from fossil fuel usage, but more from more farming to produce livestock, to produce meat, to meet the demands of a growing middle class across the world. I'm just going to end this with saying, how do we act to manage this all together? And I was delighted when I heard Mike Rand say that a climate group has been formed with 200 sub-national groups. I'm now going to tell you, we're calling for a global climate alliance of nations and states to come together under the heading of climate repair at the COP meeting, COP26, which now will be probably in November 2021, and, and give their allegiance to the notion of climate repair. And by climate repair, I mean three things. One is deep and rapid emissions reduction. Two is greenhouse gas removal. We've put too much into the atmosphere already at a rate of about 30 to 40 billion tons a year. High, highly scaled up to bring the level down from roughly 500 parts per million, including methane today, to 350 parts per million in about 30 years time. If we can get an alliance under that series of challenges, then I think our civilization has a chance and all of you young people will find that you have a good place to live on. Thank you so much for giving me this chance to talk to you. Thank you so very much, Sir David King, for your very, very important and uh, 
I want to say that you are right. I will be very quickly now, but uh, I want to say that the first thing that we need to accept if what you said at the beginning, we are a part of this world or we are a part, we belong to this world. That is so very important because as far as we don't think that we are a part of the problem, we will never be a solution of that problem. Thank you so very much for this. And uh, I will give uh, the floor to Mr. Andrew um, Rhodes Spinoza, that he's a special envoy for uh, the Ministry of Affairs in Mexico. And instead of uh, Ms. Marta Delgado, that sh she should go for a very important meeting. Thank you. Thank you so much, Andrew. Please take the floor. Thank you, thank, thank you very much. And um, uh, please receive from the Secretary Delgado uh, her regrets for her absence. She was literally summoned to a very important meeting with the Chancellor Ebrard in Mexico related to COVID-19. We and all uh, acknowledge the, 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 the context and, and the moment that we're going through. So please receive uh, her apologies for not being able to join us today. But believe me, uh, uh, Under Secretary Delgado's heart is very close to the ocean. Uh, Related, related to that, uh, and probably on, 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 on the element of positive news, just to let you know that today it was released a joint, a joint statement on the role of the sustainable ocean economy in a post-COVID-19 world uh, from the high-level panel on ocean sustainable economy that I will speak about uh, later in, in this message. So, um, as you know, Mexico, due to its cultural and natural diversity, recognizes its role and responsibility for the security of the planet, for life as, as we know it. This represents, without any doubt, both a privilege and a potential for a sustainable development for the, of the country in the coming years. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of uh, Marta Delgado and uh, the Mexican government, it is an honor and a, uh, to address this audience, especially on uh, a very important World Oceans Day. Mexico is a country with unique marine characteristics. It is one of the few mega diverse countries that possesses uh, littorals in both the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean. We have one and a half times more maritime surface than land territory, and it's the only country in the world that possesses an exclusive area, the Gulf, the Gulf of California. As uh, everybody knows, very close to hearts of many and without uh, very close to my heart. As stated before, Mexico has a high responsibility for safeguarding its biological and cultural heritage for future generations. The country has more than 11,000 kilometers of coastline, where almost 18% of the country population lives in. These communities and their livelihoods are directly benefited by the ocean, but at the same time, highly affected by the, the impacts of climate change and marine ecosystem degradation, as has been said before. Marine biodiversity and its natural capacity for providing ecosystem services is being affected as a result of several human-related pressures. This unsustainable use of biodiversity and oceanic resources will undoubtedly have great implications for present and future human health, society, and economy. COVID-19 is without any doubt the best example of this. Because all of the above and all of this, it is necessary to implement an oceanic sustainable economy and an integrated ocean management with a collaborative focus based on an equitable distribution of benefits that allows to protect the ocean and its biodiversity, prevents its degradation, and boost the prosperity of the most vulnerable coastal communities on the planet. There is no doubt that we're going through unprecedented times that force us to rethink our future. In these times, we need to think about the new role of nature in a post-pandemic recovery. The recovery strategy, strategy for everyone's benefit must aim for environmental and social sustainability at a long term. In this sense, it is vital to see the oceans as a solution for the ongoing crisis. The ocean can be an indispensable resource for guaranteeing food security, providing jobs, and boosting the world's economy. The ocean produces oxygen, stores carbon, health, produces food and medicines, offers space for economic activities, generates jobs, and facilitates international commerce and product transport. The ocean is critically important to our global economy. Collectively, 
it is estimated that the ocean-based industries and activities contribute hundreds of millions of jobs, approximately 2.5 trillion of the global economy each year, making it the world's seventh largest economy when compared with natural gross domestic products. The ocean is on the front lines of the battle against climate change. It already has absorbed 93% of the heat trap by human-generated carbon dioxide emissions. It absorbs around 25 to 30% of annual carbon dioxide emissions that would otherwise remain in the atmosphere and increase global warming. Yet, it has become a victim of climate change, putting everyone at risk. Actually, a new report of the High-Level Panel for a Sustainable Ocean Economy states that the ocean could help reduce as much as one fifth of the greenhouse gas emissions needed for 2050 in order to reduce global temperature rise below 1.5 Celsius. Additionally, marine and coastal tourism was the second largest ocean-related economy sector in 2010, next to offshore oil and gas. Ocean tourism is projected to be the top contributor of ocean industries by 2030 in terms of production value when it will account for 26% of the ocean-based economy compared with the 21% for oil and gas. Ocean tourism global direct value added was estimated at 390 billion in 2010, directly providing 7 million full jobs. In addition, the ocean is a source of recreation for millions of people in the developed and developing world. Furthermore, the ocean can provide up to six times more food than in the present, which will represent more than two thirds the animal protein needed to feed the future world population. Mexico is proud to be part of the high-level panel for a sustainable ocean economy and committed to invest in nature-based solutions to protect and restore our ecosystems to increase its resilience to the effects of climate change. The Ocean Panel is a unique initiative of 14 serving heads of government committed to catalyzing bold pragmatic solutions for ocean health and wealth that support sustainable development goals and build a, a better future for people on the planet. The panel is supported by an expert group, an advisory group, and a secretariat. Together, these countries compromise 30% of the world coastlines and exclusive economic zones and 20% of all the fisheries and shipping fleets. By working with governments, experts, and stakeholders from around the world, the Ocean Panel aims to promote solutions in order to achieve a sustainable ocean economy, as well as a new relation among people and the ocean that allows to protect effectively, produce sustainably, and prosper equitably. The Ocean Panel has commissioned a series of blue papers to explore pressing challenges at the nexus of the ocean and the economy. These papers summarize the latest science and state-of-the-art thinking about innovative ocean solutions in the technology, policy, governance, and finance realms that can help accelerate and move into a more sustainable and prosperous relationship with the ocean. At the UN General Assembly last September, and in particular at the launch of the climate change report from the high panel, our Ministry for Foreign Affairs, Marcelo Ebrard, announced two relevant commitments of Mexico regarding the ocean panel. Priority, giving a priority to local coastal communities and making sure that the ocean ecosystem services continue to be a source of well-being and resilience. First commitment was related to the expansion and strengthening uh, the effectiveness of our fishing refugia areas, which are a very important tool for achieving sustainable marine ecosystems and coastal communities. These areas are perfectly deli delimited areas that have the purpose of conserving fishing resources and contributed to the development as well as the protection of ecosystems. In addition, this will allow local fishing communities to increase their productivity and enhance their sense of belonging to the respective delimited refuge area. They also represent an important strategy for protecting and conserving the marine diversity, including fishing and other associate species, and provide, as you know, important ecological benefits. They promote connectivity among MPAs. And on the other hand, they are very useful uh, for socioeconomic matters. They increase catch, volume, and value. The second commitment consists in strengthening our efforts on coral reef restorations, especially on the Caribbean Sea. 
I must say that the Ministry for, 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 for Agriculture and Rural Development, and in particular, the National Commission for Fisheries and Aquaculture, together with the National Institute for Fisheries and Aquaculture here in Mexico, play a fundamental role as they mainstream biodiversity into those productive sectors. In order to promote a sustainable ocean economy in Mexico, other actions and recommendations from the ocean panel and appropriate to our country priorities will be implemented in the near, near future. For example, we are already designing a knowledge platform which will allow to provide a system for the follow-up monitoring and report for healthy oceans indicators related to the ocean panel recommendation. It is fundamental to rethink our policies of biodiversity protection and sustainable use of natural resources in a just and equitable manner. Otherwise, the ocean will continue to be affected and biodiversity will continue to decrease with important ecological, social, and economic repercussions in the future. Fortunately, Mexico has the necessary capacities in order to implement an integral and sustainable use of coast and the ocean, including strategies for equitable distribution of ocean benefits. Only this way, we will achieve ocean protection and prosperity for our present and future communities. We recognize that there is no time to spare. And ladies and gentlemen, you can count that Mexico will do its part. Thank you very much. And thank you for this brief, brief message. Over to you. Thank you very much, Ms. Andrew Rhodes. Uh, I will invite you to stay with us until the end of this session to be in the question and answers uh, part, please. We are going a little late, and uh, I will ask to Dr. Shonali Pashori <clears throat> to reach us now with her talk, please. Shonali, can you take the, the floor? Yes, hello, everyone, and uh, greetings to your excellencies, distinguished guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, our pop stars, and the youth. Uh, it's a real privilege to be able to speak to you today. I know we are running a little over time and uh, as a lot of the points that I wanted to make have already been made by the excellent speakers before me, uh, I, will, I will restrict my intervention to mentioning two uh, studies that I think have great importance in the discussions that we're having here today. So one of these is actually a study that was done by colleagues of mine that I was also involved in uh, at the International Institute for Applied Systems Analysis. And what this study was really trying to do was really to understand how um, vulnerabilities vary across the globe, not only to uh, you know, potential exposure of global uh, global risks, but also to understand how multiple risks are overlaid and how hotspots emerge that are areas where these multiple risks exist. So in this particular study, what we really tried to understand was not only the severity of climate change and the hazards that emerge from that, but also what is the spatial distribution of populations, how this will change over time, and what is vulnerability and capacity to prepare and manage risks. So in this particular study, we looked at indicators related to energy risks, land risks, and water risks. And we looked at this over a period of the next century, focusing really for up to the middle of the next of the century, that is up to 2050. And uh, what we found, what we concluded from this was that although the global exposure to multiple risks in terms of uh, land area, global land area, will be a very small fraction. But in fact, the risks to human populations will be very large because much of this global area that is hotspots of multiple risks occur in coastal areas and other areas of high population density. So in fact, areas where you will see increased heat stress, water stress, and variability up to 2050 will be these coastal areas and areas of high population density where hotspots will emerge. And what we also realized is in the process of this research that in fact, the risks the population that are exposed to these risks will double 
between an end of the century temperature rise of two degrees as opposed to 1.5 degrees. So in other words, if we were to restrict temperature rise to less than 1.5 degrees by the end of the century, we can really halve the population dependent on or exposed to these multiple risks. So this is an extremely important thing because we also found that, of course, these areas are not equitably distributed over the globe. In fact, Asian regions and uh, African regions and coastal Asian and African regions in particular will be areas where over 75% of the population could be living in these areas of multiple risks. So the whole equity dimension of the changes that we're looking for are extremely important in any of the management that we think about as we go forward. The only other point I'd like to make is related to another very important report of the ocean panel that was mentioned already that came out last year. So this particular report of the ocean panel, this high level panel for the oceans was on looking at possible oceans related mitigation options. We've talked a lot about what we are doing wrong. We've talked a lot about potential impacts for the economy of these uh, ocean related changes that we're observing. But there are also very important mitigation options that the oceans afford us. And this particular report highlighted six such mitigation options that can have a significant dent in reducing our emissions as we go forward. And I just briefly talk about these six options. So the biggest one is really ocean-based renewable energy. So in fact, there's a huge potential to use the oceans in both things like wind, offshore wind, uh, tidal energy, and um, other such options that can really help to reduce emissions in the future. Uh, and in addition, there is the issue of ocean-based transport, which we've heard about from several of the speakers today, decarbonizing our ocean freight transport and passenger transport can be another important way of mitigating emissions from the, that are ocean related in some way. Coastal and marine ecosystems are another way of really restoring improving emissions, reducing emissions by really reducing our uh, uh, salty marshes, restoring mangroves, sea grass beds and seaweeds. Fisheries and aquaculture are another important area. Shifting diets away from land-based meat to fisheries and having sustainable fisheries uh, and uh, uh, and mariculture can be a very important way also of meeting the growing food demand for protein in particular and reducing emissions at the same time. Uh, finally, the, uh, the final uh, um, mitigation option that was highlighted by this particular study was the issue of carbon storage in the seabed. Of course, this is an area where we don't have much experience yet, where a lot of investment and research is still required, and also understanding the impacts of this is still very, very important. However, these options provide a huge potential for us to reduce up to 4 billion tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per annum by 2030, and more than two and a half times that by 2050. So in fact, these options together could reduce our emissions gap by more than 20% by the middle of the century if we were to implement these smartly. Um, I, I really um, would not like to take more of your time now because I know it's very late in different parts of the world where you're joining from, but I think we need to remember these very important options the oceans afford us to also reduce emissions in, in addition to improving the equity, the equity in, in, in the vulnerability of people and reducing impacts to 
uh, ocean related changes, climate changes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Shamali. Norma, um, do you like to keep going? You're muted now if you're speaking, sorry. Okay, now is good. Thank you very much, Shanali, for your talk. That is a very important issue. For me, it's one of the main issues about uh, against the climate change that is mitigation. Uh, we will certainly talk about that in uh, the session of question and answers. I invite you to stay with us, please. And uh, I feel sorry for the time. Thank you so much, Shanali. And now I will give the floor to Maria Jax, please. Can you be uh, a little brief, Maria? Yeah. Please. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. We Perfect. Hear you. <laughs> Perfect. So, hi, I'm Maria Jacques, a student of chemical engineering in the University Iberoamericana in Mexico City. And I am passionate about the ocean and the environment. Since I was a little child, I went two to three times a year to the ocean. ocean and all my favorite memories have been there. So, it really breaks my heart to see all these threats to the ocean and the planet and ourselves. So man, many people would ask themselves, why am I talking here on an ocean summit if I live in the city? But many people doesn't really understand the link that we all have in common with the ocean. So today I want to talk really quick about some of these links that we have all taken for we, that we all have taken for granted or we don't even want to see. First of all, what we eat. Do we really know where it comes from? When you go to a restaurant and you eat a tuna sushi, oh, did you know that the bluefin tuna is an endangered species? In the case of Mexico, for each 10 kilograms of fish, six kilograms comes from illegal fishing. Do you ask yourself this before eating it? Overfishing can really have a big economic impact. Two, our footprint. It doesn't matter where you are, you are consuming all the time, food, clothes, accessories, and more. Do you ask yourself all, all that's behind this? Water consumption, energy consumption, people producing it, transport, all these contribute to climate change and the excess of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. CO2 is really dangerous for oceans because when it gets in contact with water, it reacts and gets acid. So the pH decreases and this affects all the species, especially corals, and this affects the tourism and the local economy. Third, this is related to point two, two do you think that you are really being clean by throwing your garbage in the dump? All the things that we consume don't disappear magically. It has to end somewhere. Maybe in an open air dumpster or in the ocean. We have seen with the present crisis that medical material end up in our oceans. We have to be more conscient each time we use a single use plastic or material. I could talk for hours about all these problems, but what I, what I really want to say today is that we need the ocean. It's an important source of food and an amazing source of biodiversity. The expansion of protected areas for marine biodiversity and existing policies and treaties that encourage responsible use of ocean resources are still insufficient to combat the adverse effects. Individual change is fundamental, but collective change is even more powerful. So I thank Pop Movement and Pop Oceans for this incredible space and motivate us to find solutions because together we can. Thank you so much, Maria, for speaking. Dr. Norma, do you have any closing words for your panel? Uh, yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Summer. Well, I thank all the speakers, brilliant speakers that we had. Thank you so much. Certainly, we will take all your, your talks, all your experience, and all your statements that you made already and the information that you gave us. We are sure that we will take uh, uh, a very strong note on that. 
and we will send you in, uh, in some days. Thank you so very much, Summer. Thank you so very much for all our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, again, thanks to all the speakers who joined us. That was our final uh, session. Now we're going to try to take a few questions. I know we're running quite behind, so we're just going to answer a few questions and um, by, sorry, excuse me, uh, Carolyn Ryder, an ocean enthusiast, contributor to the National Geographic and former conservation special, specialist at San Mateo County, California, now at the Alumni Association at Stanford University, will moderate the question and answer question session, sorry. Carolyn, uh, could you please begin with a few questions? Perfect. Thank you so much, Summer. And yeah, thank you so much again to all of our incredible speakers we've had for your inspiring words and all of your impactful work in this field. So we've already had a lot of positive comments coming in from the audience, so we really want to truly thank you for everything. Um, some quick logistical housekeeping. We already have had a number of questions coming in, so we're going to address those first. But if you do have any other questions separately, please submit them in the chat and we will follow up with you later. So we're really gonna to try to keep this um, brief as possible, maybe 15 minutes tops, just to be mindful of your time. And as Veda mentioned earlier, a lot of our speakers have had to log off because of the time difference. So thank you everyone again. Our first question is regarding CO2 regulation. Now this is being prioritized by the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And we wanna know if the same thing is being done for water pollution in other countries. So hopefully you can address that maybe for your own country or another country that you've worked with. For this question, how about we start with His Excellency Mike Ran and then follow up with Vice Minister Andrew Espinosa. Caroline, can you repeat the question? Yes. So the first question is around CO2 regulation. And since this is an issue that is being prioritized by the UN and other countries, um, this participant is wondering if the same thing is being done for water pollution in your country. So first, can we try um, His Excellency Mike Rand? or Vice Minister Andrew Espinosa, if one of you could address this question. Okay, probably I can address it. Um, is it okay with you? Perfect, thanks. Okay, so as you know, many countries are updating their national determined contributions this year uh, that will be presented probably in the next meetings of the COP once obviously they occur. So it's very important that everyone, uh, it doesn't matter if you're a young student, if you're into politics, if you're in academics, it's important to follow the process of the NDCs of each country. That's fundamental. Uh, follow the consultations and hopefully try to uh, 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 put some of your, of, of, of your concerns in, in let's say, the, 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 the reductions and the targets towards it. And obviously the adaptation and export. So that's, that's one element. Following that, logic, the same logic of the NDCs, then we can move to the, to the, the, to the quality and quantity of, of, of pollution on, 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 on water and oceans. And every country has its own legislation. And it's very important to identify within that legis legislation the leverage and the key entry points to contribute to obviously legislation and, and, and policy without, without any doubt that local action and organization is fundamental to tackle the problem. Just to let you know that also in the high level panel for sustainable ocean economy, I believe last week or two weeks ago, it's complicated with the shutdown and locks that is going on. Uh, there was a launch of, of also a blue paper related to ocean pollution. I invite all participants to go to the ocean panel webpage and download the report related to pollution. So again, it's important to be active and proactive and identifying the key entry points for the national legislation of each country, because at the end of the day, uh, conventions and treaties getting to some point, then you have to identify the key entry points within the, the national policy and try to figure out how to affect those. So three, three elements, NDCs, climate change, 
look for your local legislation and how you can entry and input into it. And finally, get informed. And in that sense, follow the ocean panel activity. Uh, it, it has been relevant. And I, I just want to highlight that uh, again, there was a joint statement uh, launched by the high level panel um, chiefs of state heads of state, so please uh, follow it through. It's, it's, it's an interesting joint statement. And uh, never, never, never lose your passion and, and hope. Perfect, thank you. I think that's great advice for all of us on the call, to never lose your passion. Great, and I think, um, His Excellency, your Mike Rand, you were muted previously. Do you wanna unmute to answer the question about water pollution in your country? I think there's an error going on with the mute function. So I will move on to our next question. All right, our second question is around plastic use. Um, Your Excellency Lawrence Gonsi, you mentioned dealing with plastic should be a priority. So I'd like to ask you what do you think governments can do to prevent plastic from entering the oceans? And also, do you think this is an issue that can be tackled during a crisis or a pandemic such as now? Hello, are you hearing me? Yes. Yeah, yes, okay. Well, there are a number of initiatives and some of them have already been mentioned, I think mostly by Michael Rand. Um, uh, the initiative to, to reduce the use of plastic bags, the initiative to change from disposable plastic uh, bottles uh, back to, uh, the, or the, to, to reusable, um, uh, containers, etc. In the case of Malta, for example, until a few years ago, we, um, most of our soft, well, the two major soft drinks companies in Malta, being an island, um, used to use glass uh, bottles, which then used to be collected. There was an incentive for consumers to return the bottles. The bottles would be uh, washed, uh, reused, and reused, I think, for about 12 different cycles. So you can imagine um, the impact uh, that that had in the sense that um, plastic just just did not make sense at the time. However, unfortunately, a decision was taken way back um, by these industries to move on to PET. And the result is, is that um, uh, we are now surrounded by mountains of plastic and nobody really knows what to do with this. But bottom line, I think I would I would latch on to what was said by one of the speakers, it must start from us. Each one of us uh, must make a choice and must decide to go for the items that, are, uh, that have the least impact on our environment, um, um, uh, uh, not just where plastic is concerned, but for everything else. So if it starts from us, but then I would suggest strongly that our young um, generation pushes all the necessary buttons that are needed to push in order to get our politicians, in order to get our decision makers and decision takers to really go for a dramatic change. I think I honestly believe that this can be done, but it's up to us to really shoulder the responsibility we have and insist that this change, this change needs to take place. Terrific. Hello. Thank you so much. Oh, can you hear me? Oh, it's can. Mike Perfect. We've, had, oh, we've, had, we've just had a technological breakdown here, but just on that issue and following, up, following on from Lawrence, mm -hmm. in the 1970s, uh, my state um, in 1976 introduced container deposit legislation that we then updated a few years ago. And what it means is that there is literally no litter because in terms of containers, so every glass bottle, plastic bottle, uh, cartons, paper cartons for milk, whole range of things. We pay people for every item 10 cents that they bring to a recycling center. Now, as a result of this, lots of clubs, sports clubs, Boy Scouts, Girl Guides, they go around collecting this because they can raise money. And then meanwhile, the recycling centers recycle these bottles. So, you know, every single bottle of beer, every single uh, Coca-Cola can, there's also cans as well, you get a 10 cent refund if you 
send it in, if you take it into recycling. So this has had a number of effects. One, incredibly clean roadsides, incredibly clean waterways and beaches and, and, and the sea in terms of those things. But also at the same time, it's created a multi-million dollar recycling industry that employs one hell of a lot of people. Now it's interesting, so that was introduced in 76. It's just starting to be introduced in other states around uh, Australia. And again, you have to put up with a whole range of big companies coming out and saying this will destroy the industry, just the same as the plastic bag ban in 2008. And of course, it's rubbish. What they're saying is rubbish because none of those things happened and the public love it. So politicians won't lose votes in doing so. So one of the things in terms of you know, plastic, in terms of cans and everything else I've mentioned, here's a way that lots of jurisdictions around the world can make a serious difference, including cities as well as um, states, provinces and regions. Great. Thank you so much for sharing. All right, so our next question is, um, what have young people done in your country and what specifically can young people do to have some sort of a meaningful impact? So I'd really like to open this up to any one of our speakers who have been on the call and if you could please limit your response to about a minute or so. Um, let's begin with Sir David King, if you wouldn't mind um, answering this question. Do you mind quickly repeating it? I, I was dealing with Not some, at all. Yeah. Perfect. So the question is asking about what young people have done in your country and also what specifically can they do in order to have some sort of meaningful impact? Well, that's a very, very good question. And I would say young people in Britain and across Europe and many parts of the world are playing a critical role. If, if, we, if we go into schools, um, uh, young people from the age of 10 upwards are very much engaged with the problems we're now discussing. I don't think this is something that needs to be stimulated in a very formal way because it just emerges from the teaching they're getting from their parents talking to them. Uh, but what, what can happen? Uh, and of course, we, we've got this wonderful example of a Swedish girl, Greta Thunberg, who has su had such a major impact around the world. So I, I think the, the future is with these young people. People like yourself know that you are going to be around for a good deal longer than I am. And the world is not going to be a good place unless we can turn this around. So I'm always keen to work with young people, talk to young people. I go into schools. I go into universities, where, wherever I'm invited and can do it, I will go. Thank you so much. Anybody else want to answer that call about how young people can have a positive impact? Yes, this is Andrew. I'm oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Thank you, thank you very much, Mike. Um, I, I agree with, with uh, what David just mentioned. Uh, also highlight, for instance, a very concrete ex uh, uh, example in Mexico related to the Convention on Biological Diversity. There's obviously youth groups uh, related to it. And at least in Mexico, the network of youth related to the Convention on Biological Diversity has been very active. Um, not only uh, working with the, the, the official delegation, uh, reviewing its recommendations and obviously elements and inputs to it, but also very active on social media. Uh, they even have a, 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 a World Ocean Day event later today with youth. So, so, so my comment will be, it's very important for them to get engaged. It's very important for them to manage social media. Everything can, you can change a policy of a country with a tweet nowadays. So it's a very important for youth to get vocal. But above all, even if they're active, even their social media, it's fundamental that their arguments, the, 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 the elements that they communicate are science-based, are robust, are technical. They need, they need that, uh, uh, that, 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 that uh, uh, certainty 
of data. No? Uh, so get engaged, get vocal, but above all, get uh, robust technical scientific arguments for your positions. Thank you. Thank Maybe you so if I could just make a comment on that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I totally agree with Sir David. The best questions I ever got as Premier came going to schools and, and they can put you, they can, they, they can ask you some hard ones. And also we set up a number of things. For instance, we put solar panels onto the roofs of hundreds of schools and it was integrated into the curriculum for sort of environment and uh, and for maths so i'd go into schools and even little kids would proudly tell me how much uh, solar power was being produced that day and they had all of these charts to show it through the different uh, seasons we also set up a youth conservation corps for young unemployed people who through the process of working in national parks uh, big uh, uh, reforestation programs also gained skills and credits that they could articulate in order to get apprenticeships and so on. So I think you're absolutely right. It's the young people you have just got to get involved politically. Ultimately, it's about, as I said during my presentation, you've got the, you know, the power when you vote to be able to make sure you don't vote for people who are climate deniers. And I, get, I encourage people to get involved in political parties and get involved, get, you know, seek meetings with their local members of parliament and representatives. There's, a, you know, there's, a, there's much greater power that you have than many people realize. Thank you so much. I think that's a perfect segue into our last question. It's just directed at the youth speakers on this call. If you wanna go ahead and answer what you think in particular youth can do, or if there's anything that you would like to share to some of the leaders on this call of um, creating that lasting impact. So maybe we can start off with um, Caroline and go from there. And Lauren Hello. Sandberg, perfect. Uh, so um, are we answering, sorry, are we answering this question or the question about what motivates you to be a champion for ocean health? Either Anyone? one. Yep, if okay. you wanna answer either one real quick. Um, so I'll answer the one about what youth can do. I think that well, if you, you, I think that youth should start in their own community and then they can branch out from there. Because if you look into it, there's tons of groups and probably your own community that you don't know about. Um, like I know in my community, there was lots of groups that I've just recently been in communication with that I never knew existed before. So I think the first step is just to research groups in your area and then you can get involved with, the, with them. And then you can even start your own projects too, but just reaching out to experts and like there's all these experts on this call um, but local experts are a great way to start too. And then I'll also um, talk about how, like why I'm motivated or how I'm motivated. And lots of times I am motivated just by other youth because I see other youth leaders um, taking action and having great successes. And that just motivates me to move along and push along with my own projects. Um, and then, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think something that motivates me too is just like when I can see actual change being made. Um, and like even small successes can be very inspiring and they can lead us to take action on a bigger scale. So even if we start with something small, that inspires me to go even bigger from there. And when I see that we can really make a difference, then I'm more motivated to actually make that change happen. And then um, one thing that I'd just like to tell everyone and also political leaders specifically listening today is that the time to act is right now. We can't waste any more time to take action on and make changes and we must drastically reduce our greenhouse gas emissions before it's too late. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Caroline and Lauren. Um, would either Summer, Anna, or Maria have anything else they'd like to add before we um, have Ash close? Sure, um, I can. I would also like to address the question of what youth can do. I think um, from what I've seen working from youth in Mexico and everything, people sometimes don't realize how much um, like power they have right they maybe they have a really good idea they, that they would like to implement and they don't really know how to like the like Lauren and Caroline said they don't reach out to older people who have more experience so I think doing that is really important and also using the different platforms that exist to take projects forward for example pop movement and the pop, pop ocean that hosted this <laughs> event today are a great way for people to be able to take their projects forward 
I also think it's really important for the youth to stay informed of what is happening, what really motivates them to make a change and everything. For example, in Mexico now, 75% um, of the budget for um, natural protected areas was taken away. And I think it's very important for the youth to um, be informed of what's happening, what can be done, and in the future, make the right decisions on who to vote for once, like for the ones that are 18 and older, and really take into consideration that are people that, like Mike Rand said, they're not climate deniers and they really have environmental protection in their high priority list. I just have one quick thing to add. I also think something really important to help youth get inspired is just to connect with other youth and just talk to other youth around the world and see if they're doing any project or, or if they have any ideas for projects that you could work together on and implement in your different communities around the world and just make a more global network of youth because I know we're all going through the same exact thing and it, it varies on the different effects that we're uh, experiencing, but we can all relate to each other. And I think we connecting, like we can meet people through these types of calls and through social media. I think that's very important to um, take action that way. Thanks so much, Summer. Ah, uh, sorry. <laughs> I would like to add something. Uh, I think that collective action is always more powerful than individual. So first of all, I would recommend to find people that are also motivated on the same objective. And secondly, I think that intergeneration interaction is really important because young people, we like to act right now. And all people like more like the information, the scientific background. So I think it's, and um, we have to have both so maybe to have this interaction with all the young people, it, it really helps to equilibrate like the action and to really be informed. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everybody. Really appreciate it. And we're going to move on. This is closing comments by Dr. Ash Bachari. Here we go. Uh, thank you so much, <laughs> uh, Caroline. Caroline, thank you very much. And a big thank you to everyone. I would like to especially thank our leaders and distinguished speakers present here who made the Pop Ocean Virtual Summit a reality. Thank you for your experience, your knowledge, and wisdom, which have added great value to the Pop Ocean Initiative and, in particular, to advocacy for the ocean giving the several hundred participants and viewers from, from Zoom and Facebook and so on, um, a tremendous, in, tremendous amount of insight and perspective on the importance of protecting our ocean as well as, very importantly, tools to take action in their countries, geographies, and around the world. Uh, I also want to say uh, that for those who are new to the pop movement, may I please request you to join. There's a link in the chat box. I'm gonna request Komal, if you don't mind just dropping it there. Uh, it'll only take a few seconds to put in your details, but we greatly look forward to staying in touch with all of you to follow up on the activities, programs, summits, and events that the Pop Up Ocean Initiative intends to organize in the weeks and months to come. We will be taking, we will be organizing these and we'd love to, to have all of you engaged. And I just wanna convey our deepest thanks uh, your ex for your wisdom your inspiration your leadership and um, and finally I would like to also close by saying I invite you let's join hands and protect our planet the time is now we've heard that over and over through the course of uh, the last some hours and I want to say in um, my father's words universal family let's seize the moment and become leaders of urgent action under the pop movement. Thank you, all of you, for being here, for contributing, and being part of this movement. And as I close, I also want to say a, a very big thank you to the pop family and to the pop ocean family for everything. So it's been a great pleasure and honor. Many thanks. That's the, that's the link there. So if you could, um, yeah, if you could fill that out and
let us have your details. We'll look forward to staying in touch. Thank you all very, very much. Over to you, Summer. Yes, thank you all for joining. This was incredibly inspiring, and I'm so happy to have so many different countries represented here and so many different perspectives from youth to politicians to students and all kinds of people. Thank you so much for joining everybody. We'll be in touch for sure uh, with, with all of the activities that are in the pipeline. Um, and we look forward to having you join. A big welcome to the Pop family. Movimiento pop, los jóvenes, you know, you just can't stop. Working coast to coast en el mar, do your bit and become a real pop star. Youth inspired by knowledge, whether at home, school, or college. Stop and visualize, and you will realize real fears. I'm now an ocean filled with tears. I keep you alive with oxygen and air to thrive. But now I'm still where once filled with krill. Overfishing for money and pescado, you left me nothing but lonely, sad, and enojado. Today I feel nothing but the throttle of your plastic cap and bottle no life no weed no fish and thanks to you i'm hardly left with the last wish so open your eyes and realize it's real that sea level rise i'm brimming with co2 could it be thanks to you bleaching quarrel or just the absence of moral a lack of biodiversity will bring adversity with any number of years in university not long from now you go like wow when the day will dawn and everything i've got to offer is gone i mean nada even dia dia agada but hey, it's not too late to alter your state. So stop acidification across the world and in every nation. Spare la preciosa vida marina. You know it's divina. Prevent extinction with total conviction. Do your bit for flora and fauna. Before the ocean is nothing but a breathless hot sauna. Don't you see? It's time to get drastic and eliminate that plastic. Reduce pollution and become the solution. Protect the coast. Make it for our most. Stop the commotion. Tap your emotion. Change your notion and protect the ocean. Movie me and top pop. Los jóvenes, you know you just can't stop. Youth inspired by knowledge. 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 Inspired by knowledge.